Welcome to our course on geometry processing with intrinsic triangulations. Let me tell you what this is all about. Geometric computing is everywhere. Year after year, we have more and more 3D data in the form of 3D scans, technical assets, scientific imagery, user creations, and so much more. And there's so much we want to do with that data. We want to perform simulation on it, or animate it, or use it in geometric machine learning and display it in VR. The umbrella term for all of the algorithms that take us from this data to these applications is geometry processing. And in geometry processing, we search for algorithms that are general, simple, robust, efficient, and offer new capabilities. What we found in geometry processing is that not all meshes are equal. Oftentimes a mesh, which is a perfectly good representation of some shape of interest, just isn't ready to support some computation that you need to perform. And this can be a real headache in practice. It can happen, and it does happen quite frequently, that you have an algorithm which has been implemented perfectly correctly, and it should give you the right answer, but when you run it on some data, it outputs essentially nonsense. And what's going wrong here is that your mesh just isn't numerically ready to support the computation that you need to perform. So the perspective we'll take in this course is what do we do with a bad mesh? What do we do when we have some mesh that represents a shape we care about, but isn't ready to support the computation that we want to perform? And the solution we'll look at is to throw away the vertex positions of our meshes and think of them only in terms of their edge lengths to encode the geometry. This sounds like a really crazy thing to do, but it's called an intrinsic triangulation. And the shift in perspective unlocks a lot of really powerful algorithms in geometry processing and a lot of solutions to hard problems in robust computing with surface meshes. Intrinsic triangulations have a long and rich history in mathematics, but what's changed recently is the development of data structures and algorithms to make them useful for a wide variety of tasks in practical geometry processing. We have new data structures that offer powerful and efficient encodings of intrinsic triangulations on surfaces, as well as supporting new operations. And we can use these new operations to develop an ever-growing suite of retriangulation routines to develop high-quality intrinsic triangulations to perform our computations on. And furthermore, we can use these intrinsic triangulations not just to make existing algorithms more robust, but also to come up with whole new algorithms developed from the intrinsic perspective. The purpose of this course is that you'll come away with a knowledge of the core theory of intrinsic triangulations, and you'll understand the benefits and capabilities of these techniques in practice. We'll show you how to implement your own intrinsic triangulation routines, including a tutorial where we walk through coding up some of these techniques from scratch. We'll see how you can use intrinsic triangulations to make existing algorithms in geometry processing and simulation more robust. And we'll also discuss some open problems in intrinsic triangulations so you can start attacking them yourself. This course is geared at engineers and programmers who work in scientific computing and simulation, 3D modeling and animation, or really who work with any kind of geometric data. It's geared towards researchers who want to study intrinsic triangulations, or mathematicians who want to see the theory in action, or really anyone who's just excited to hear a bit more about intrinsic triangulations. We're Nicholas Sharp, Mark Gillespie, and Keenan Crane. We've been studying these intrinsic triangulations for the past years, and we're really excited to share what we've learned. We're extremely grateful for the funding that made all of this work possible. Now an outline for how the course will proceed. After the welcome, we'll have some more motivations for intrinsic triangulations to put them in context and explain why all of these techniques are worth learning about. Then we'll do a basic introduction to get you a better idea of just how intrinsic triangulations actually work. After the intro, we'll have a coding exercise in which we implement some of the basic subroutines and in intrinsic triangulations totally from scratch. Then we'll have a theory section, which is a deeper dive into the machinery of intrinsic triangulations. The next section will be on applications, where we see the impact that intrinsic triangulations can have on many problems across geometry processing and simulation. And we'll see some generalizations to intrinsic triangulations that allow them to be applied to a broader suite of problems. We'll wrap up with some open questions in the field. Now I'll hand it off to Keenan. Hi, this is Keenan Crane. So before we get too deep into the details, I think it's important to motivate why you should even consider this strange and different approach to thinking about meshes. And our story really begins with a story about 19th century mathematics. So back then, if you wanted to talk about a shape, a surface, 
you'd have to describe how it gets embedded in space. In other words, you'd have to give it a so-called extrinsic description, like a parameterization. Okay, But a big development by Gauss and Riemann and others was to realize that there's a whole lot about geometry that doesn't depend on the way a shape sits in space. And so you can toss out this embedding into Rn and instead work with a purely intrinsic description, like an atlas of charts, where if you walk off one side of one chart, you end up on another one. Okay, And so this ability to work with geometry without having to think about how it gets embedded in space even though that seems maybe totally ordinary to some of us now, that was actually a real revolution in the way we think about geometry leading in the 20th century to some pretty important discoveries like Einstein and Hilbert's work on the theory of general relativity. Okay, so what about the computational side? Well, right now, most people who work with geometric data, so programmers and engineers and so forth, typically assume that the geometry of a mesh is given by vertex positions in maybe two or three dimensional space. And so I'll call this standard picture the extrinsic picture. Again, it depends on how the shape sits in space. Okay, instead in this course, we want you to think about a different picture, the intrinsic picture, where we throw away these vertex positions and just store the edge lengths instead. Okay, so if you're a mathematician, you might just call this object a triangulation, but for clarity, I'm going to call it an intrinsic triangulation because it captures only intrinsic data about the shape. For instance, how far is it from one point to another along the surface, but not how it sits in space. And actually where this all starts to get really interesting is when we have an interplay between an intrinsic and extrinsic description of a shape. So for instance, I can take an extrinsically defined polyhedron like this cube on the left and triangulate the same underlying space by many, many different intrinsic triangulations, right? So now even though I have triangles that appear to be bent extrinsically on my cube, well, as long as those bent triangles don't contain any vertices, they can be unfolded or flattened out into the plane without any stretching. And there they can be described by just three ordinary edge lengths. So again, this intrinsic triangulation sitting on top of the cube is given just by ordinary mesh connectivity plus edge lengths. Okay. So what's nice about this setup is that now we have the freedom to triangulate our surface in all sorts of different ways that we couldn't before without changing its geometry, which as we'll see opens up a whole world of possibilities that we don't have in ordinary geometry processing and mesh processing. Okay, but to really take advantage of this perspective, we also have to think about some computational issues. In particular, what are good data structures for keeping track of the correspondence between these different triangulations? And once we have those data structures, how can we build useful algorithms on top of these data structures? Okay, and that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna look at a lot today. A natural question to ask at this moment is, well, why are we doing this? Why might it be useful to draw one triangulation on top of another? So I'm going to try to motivate this from three different angles. The first one is uh, classical computational geometry. So let's say I have a triangle mesh in the plane, and I want to somehow make it sort of better, but while preserving the original vertices. Okay. Well, that's not too hard. For instance, you could say, okay, why don't you flip some of the edges until you have a so-called Delaunay triangulation? But if I were to also force you to preserve not only the vertices of the input, but the edges of the input, you'd say, boy, that's really annoying. Because now kind of the only thing I can do is maybe refine the triangles in the hope that things look a little better, okay? But that annoying situation is exactly what we always have to deal with with 3D surface processing. If you want to exactly preserve the input geometry, you're forced to preserve both the input vertices and the input edges. And so basically your only option is to refine, right? Or is it? So what we're gonna see later on is that intrinsic triangulations basically let us use a polyhedral surface as our background domain for triangulation and mesh processing rather than using the Euclidean plane as the background domain. 
And the result is that we'll be able to directly translate a bunch of important computational geometry algorithms to surfaces like Delaunay refinement, constrained Delaunay triangulation, Steiner tree approximation, and so forth. Another angle or motivation is scientific computing. So here we might be using our mesh to solve a physical equation like linear elasticity, and the challenge is that our mesh must now serve two conflicting goals. It has to both uh, describe the shape of the domain itself, and it has to be used to define a basis of functions where we approximate the solution. Okay, so it kind of feels like a, a no free lunch situation. Our input mesh is a concise description of the exact geometry of the domain, but it might have very poor element quality. We could refine this mesh to get good elements, but now the size of the mesh blows up. So here by a factor of about 100. Or we could get a nice small mesh with good element quality, but now the quality of geometric approximation really suffers. Okay, so there's this tension between these, these three conflicting goals. A nice thing about this intrinsic viewpoint is that we can actually decouple the basis functions used to represent the geometry from the bases used to encode function spaces. And although the geometry in this case is piecewise linear, we can use whatever basis functions we want to approximate functions, right? If we have any kind of triangular basis functions, we can use them on this new intrinsic triangulation. So now we kind of get the best of all worlds. Our intrinsic mesh perfectly preserves the input geometry. It has good element quality and the mesh size still stays pretty reasonable. The final angle, and the one we'll probably focus most on in this talk, is digital geometry processing. So one observation we can make is that many algorithms for shape analysis and shape processing are expressed from the very beginning purely in terms of intrinsic data. For instance, we often care only about shapes up to isometry, and very often algorithms are built on top of something called the Laplace Beltrami operator, which much like the FFT in classical signal processing, is sort of a Swiss army knife of geometry processing. Likewise, other quantities we care about, the harmonic spectrum, the Gaussian curvature, geodesic distances, and so forth, uh, are all intrinsic quantities that a lot of algorithms are built on top of. So if that's the case, if our algorithms are built on top of intrinsic data, then it's pretty natural to ask, why are we trying to process the mesh itself from an extrinsic point of view? Another big challenge is that the geometry countered, encountered in real data sets can be really, really bad. So to quote Jean-Paul Sartre, hell is other people's meshes. And if you've ever worked with real geometric data, you know how true this is. Uh, the bad news is, I'm sorry to say, that data just keeps getting worse and worse over the time. So as we start to see, for instance, more user data from scanning and 3D printing or, or whatever it is, uh, the data is just getting harder to work with because you know, non-experts are creating it. It's no longer expert engineers and artists. So this is a problem that's not going to get better on its own. right? We really need a way to help users of geometric software abstract away the mesh and just focus on the geometry. Well, in numerical linear algebra, there's a really nice way to do this abstraction, this nice idea of preconditioning. So if we have a badly conditioned linear system, we first apply some kind of transformation, then we solve using a solver that's not particularly robust, then we invert this transformation back to get our final solution, right? And the beauty of this approach is that this whole process can be hidden from the user inside of kind of a black box, right? They just type backslash in MATLAB or whatever, and everything's all good. All of the complexity has been encapsulated. So the user can forget about the matrix and just focus on what it actually represents. Well, that's exactly what the intrinsic perspective helps us do with geometry. We can take a bad mesh, come up with a much nicer intrinsic triangulation, run an existing algorithm that's maybe not so robust, and then transfer the solution in one way or another back to the input mesh, okay? So again, the idea is that you wanna just be able to focus on the geometry, on the shape, rather than struggling with mesh defects and so forth, okay? Again, we can hide this all from the user. So hopefully that helps set the stage a little bit.
Um, one small but important thing to keep in mind as you go through this course, just to frame kind of where these ideas can be useful, is that all the algorithms we'll talk about are actually super fast. So when we talk about and show, for instance, remeshing operations and, and so forth, this is always something that takes just milliseconds, right? Rather than seconds or minutes or hours like you might see or be used to for some like volumetric meshing algorithms, okay? Um, it's also important to identify what can't we do? What, what are intrinsic triangulations not good at? Well, for one thing, they're not really helping us improve geometric approximation quality, and they're not meant for repairing topological defects, so holes or, or spurious handles in the input. For better or for worse, the approach that we'll talk about is going to exactly preserve the given geometry and topology. So we're going to kind of assume that whatever shape you put in is the one that you really want to talk about. The other big issue that we have to grapple with is that an intrinsic triangulation is not a standard triangle mesh. I mean, that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it powerful. But that also adds some complexity when you're trying to interface this intrinsic mesh with other algorithms, you know, upstream or downstream. The good news is that a lot of the additional complexity can actually be encapsulated in a standard software interface. So we're going to see that the way that you write algorithms on an intrinsic mesh really looks very much like the way you write algorithms on a, a standard triangle mesh. And there's also a lot of different ways to interact with standard data uh, upstream and downstream, you know, basically coming out of that black box. Finally, the techniques we'll talk about today are not suited for volumetric meshes, at least not yet. So everything we'll talk about today are for surface meshes, but what that means is there are a lot of really interesting open questions about how to extend these ideas to the volumetric case. Okay, I'll wrap up this little segment with some historical background on intrinsic triangulations. So remember that historically the progression in geometry was from uh, extrinsic geometry like parameterized surfaces to intrinsic geometry like Riemannian manifolds and we said that this perspective shift was really really necessary to develop some big ideas in geometry and physics like relativity. Okay so given that story it's actually pretty natural so that some of the very first work on intrinsic triangulations was done in an effort to guess what solve Einstein's equations of general relativity. So here's a very classic paper by Tullio Regge from 1960, and it's actually remarkable how much it resembles our modern way of thinking about discrete geometry. In fact, it's even motivated by solving equations on a computer. So you could, you could actually think of this as one of the very earliest papers on geometry processing. Digging a bit deeper, we find that Regge was really exploring this idea of intrinsic triangulations, and he came to all the same conclusions that we will in this course. So he says, for instance, all the data that we need to describe this thing is just the connectivity and the edge lengths. The particular choice of edges actually turns out not to be that important, and the edge lengths give us the discrete version of, of the metric or the metric tensor. Okay. So here's a little longer history, starting with Alexandrov's proof that any convex polyhedral metric can be embedded in R3. So maybe one of the first people to really be thinking deeply about polyhedra in an intrinsic sense. Going through work, lots of work by many people, Thurston and others on using triangulations to understand three manifolds, and then a gradual buildup of tools for working with polyhedral surfaces, which I'll go through in a little bit. But the main thing to notice is that so far we haven't really seen that many practical algorithms that use intrinsic triangulations for geometry processing, for physical simulation, and so forth. And the reason for that is that we're still missing some very basic ingredients. And so that's what we're going to start building toward in our next segment. Next, I'll give a brief introduction to intrinsic triangulations. By now, you should have some sense of what this intrinsic triangulation business is all about. My goal in this section is to provide a crash course and all the background necessary to use intrinsic triangulations so that you can all get your hands dirty in a concrete coding tutorial coming up next. After that, we'll revisit a lot of these ideas and go into much more depth about them. This section will be structured around three basic questions. First, what is a mesh? Second, what is a good mesh? And finally, what can we do with a good mesh? So first off, what is a mesh? To us, meshes are comprised of two types of information, 
First, you have the connectivity, which tells you how the mesh elements are connected to each other, but doesn't pin down the shape, size, or location of these elements. This is similar to working with the adjacency matrix of a graph, which tells you which nodes are connected by edges, but nothing more. Then you also have some geometry associated to the mesh, which provides complementary information about the shapes of your elements. For example, we can specify some extrinsic geometry on a mesh simply by giving its vertices concrete positions in 3D space. As we mentioned earlier, this division between connectivity and geometry also reflects the standard treatment in continuous mathematics, where a smooth surface is often thought of as an embedding of an abstract topological surface into 3D space. Now I'll go a bit more in depth about connectivity. We will represent our connectivity by a topological triangulation, which describes how a collection of vertices, edges, and triangular faces should be connected up to form a mesh. Such triangulations describe only the connectivity and make no assumptions about geometry. For instance, triangles are not required to be flat, and edges are not required to be straight. One simple data structure for representing a triangulation is the face vertex adjacency list. This is just a table where each row corresponds to a face and its entries give the face's vertices. For example, in this simple mesh, face 0 is comprised of vertices 0, 1, and 2, and face 1 is comprised of vertices 1, 0, and 3. This representation is quite popular since it's super simple and easy to implement. You just need an f by 3 array. However, using only this array can be quite unwieldy. For example, it has no direct representation of edges, so it's hard to loop over all edges incident on a particular vertex, or even just loop over the three faces neighboring a given face. In this course, we'll augment our adjacency lists with a gluing map, which specifies how the three sides of a triangle get glued to sides of other triangles in the mesh. Returning to our simple mesh, we label the sides of each face as 0, S1, and S2. Then the gluing map simply states that the first side of face 0 is glued to the first side of face 2 and vice versa. The addition of the face sides and gluing map makes it easy to figure out F0's neighbors and allows us to explicitly represent mesh edges in terms of these new face sides. Amazingly, in addition to caching some useful data, the gluing map also enriches the space of triangulations that we can represent. What can we represent now with this edge gluing data structure? Well, we can take a collection of triangles and glue their edges together to create a surface. Formally, this is known as a delta complex. At first glance, this sounds exactly like the sort of thing that we represent every day using vertex face adjacency lists, but there's a key difference. In a delta complex, the vertices or edges of a single triangle can get glued together. For example, we can glue two edges of a triangle together to form a cone, and we can even construct a torus using just two triangles in one single vertex. If we try to represent this torus by its adjacency list, we just get an array of all zeros, which is not very informative at all. While these examples are unlikely to arise in real-world input, allowing our triangulations to reside in this larger space of irregular delta complexes actually offers us a ton of flexibility and is indeed essential for all of the powerful retriangulation algorithms that we'll introduce later. For now, we'll make some simplifying assumptions about our triangulations. First, we will assume that they're manifold. This means that each point in the domain must have a neighborhood which is a topological disk. Concretely, this boils down to two simple conditions. First, each edge must have either one or two neighboring faces. Edges with too many neighbors, such as this red star, are not manifold. The second requirement is that each vertex's neighboring faces must form a single cycle. The vertex of this blue cone has a disk-like neighborhood and is thus manifold, but the vertex of this red hourglass is not manifold. Our other simplifying assumption is that our triangulations are oriented. Each face of a triangle mesh can be oriented in two ways, clockwise or counterclockwise. A triangulation is said to be oriented if all pairs of neighboring faces are consistently oriented, meaning that they both point in the same direction. Note that somewhat counterintuitively, this means that they actually point in opposite directions along their shared edge. For most of this course, we will assume that our triangulations are oriented, and in particular when we use face vertex adjacency lists, we will generally assume that the vertices are listed in order. These assumptions, that our mesh is manifold and oriented, are pretty helpful when designing algorithms and traversing meshes, but later on in the course, Nick will talk about how we can use intrinsic triangulations even when these assumptions do not hold. Now I'll talk a bit about the geometry of meshes. Recall that the mesh geometry provides information about the shape of your mesh elements. There are two perspectives that we can take on this geometry, the extrinsic perspective versus the intrinsic perspective.
Extrinsic properties fundamentally depend on how the mesh sits in space, whereas intrinsic quantities do not. For example, the bounding diameter of a piece of string is extrinsic, while its length is intrinsic. The extrinsic geometry of a triangle mesh can be specified by providing positions in R3 for each of its vertices. This is the standard way of thinking about mesh geometry, and for good reason. It's very intuitive and easy to work with. However, in this course, we take the alternative intrinsic perspective, which encodes the geometry of a mesh using only its edge lengths. This relaxation in what geometry means offers us a ton of flexibility and allows us to bypass several long-standing geometric challenges. We can compute a lot of stuff about a triangle purely from its edge lengths. For example, the classical Heron's formula provides a triangle's area in terms of its edge lengths. Similarly, the law of cosines allows us to express a triangle's corner angles in terms of its edge lengths. In general, three edge lengths determine a triangle on the plane up to rigid motion, so we can compute all sorts of data purely from these lengths. However, note that they don't tell us anything about how the triangle sits in 3D space. More abstractly, our edge lengths describe what's known as a polyhedral cone metric, that is, a space with no intrinsic curvature except at a collection of vertices. The faces of our mesh are clearly flat, and while the edges may not look flat in 3D space, each edge and its two neighboring triangles could be laid out flat in the plane, so these edges are intrinsically flat. From the intrinsic perspective, there's no curvature at faces or edges, it's all concentrated at vertices. Thus, a really important mental model is to smooth out the edges and just leave the vertices, which now look like cones. And now that we've smoothed out the surface, the particular edges that we picked start looking a lot less important. Indeed, we can describe this exact same surface with many different triangulations. From the intrinsic point of view, there's absolutely nothing special about the one that we started with. One basic tool for exploring this large space of triangulations is the intrinsic edge flip. Suppose we want to flip this edge. Importantly, we don't connect the opposite vertices by a straight line segment in 3D space. Instead, you should think of these intrinsically flipped edges as tracing out a straight path along the surface. Note though that we do not have to explicitly keep track of this path along the surface. Right now our mesh is just connectivity plus edge lengths, so when we perform this flip we just update our connectivity and the length of the flipped edge. The very important fact, again, is that this intrinsic flip leaves the original geometry unchanged. In the extrinsic world, your connectivity and geometry are tightly coupled. It's generally impossible to change the connectivity like this without also changing the surface geometry. The intrinsic perspective allows us to decouple the two, giving us the freedom to alter the mesh connectivity via these edge flips while always encoding the exact same intrinsic geometry. After performing a bunch of edge flips, we can obtain an intrinsic mesh whose connectivity is quite different from the input, but which encodes the same geometry. We will visualize these intrinsic meshes by drawing them along the surface of the input. We draw the edges of the original mesh as a black wireframe, and we draw the faces of the intrinsic mesh as colorful triangles. Note that the intrinsic triangles may bend across the edges of the original mesh. There are many other ways that we might want to change connectivity beyond edge flips. For example, we might want to insert vertices in faces or along edges. These operations are common in the extrinsic setting, as you can actually do them without distorting the geometry. But recently these operations have also been introduced for intrinsic triangulations too, paving the way for some exciting new algorithms. For simplicity, I'll just stick with edge flips for now, but we'll discuss these other operations in more detail later on. Okay, so now that we've established what a mesh is, what is a good mesh? As Keenan mentioned earlier, we look for three key properties in a mesh element quality, mesh size, and geometric fidelity. Each of these is essential. Consider this gear. It's a fine surface, but I wouldn't want to compute with it. The element quality is awful. All those sliver triangles could cause serious issues when performing numerical computations on this mesh. And this gear? Well, there are just way too many faces. Even the simplest computation will take much longer if you make the mesh 100 times bigger. Or how about this last gear? Well, the surface is just wrong. The triangles no longer accurately represent the gear that we really care about. A good mesh satisfies all three conditions simultaneously. It provides a good approximation for the true geometry that we care about, it doesn't use too many elements, and its elements are good. For now, we'll focus on the Dolani condition as a measure of element quality, although later we'll also consider other possible quality metrics, such as minimal angle bounds or face area distributions.
If you haven't heard of them before, Delaunay triangulations are a classic object from planar computational geometry. So let's forget about surfaces for a moment and consider instead points in the plane. There are many ways that we could triangulate them, but there's one triangulation which is, in many respects, the best option, the Delaunay triangulation. I'll give a precise definition in a moment, but for now the important thing is that Delaunay triangulations have a ton of beneficial properties. For example, they maximize the minimum angle of the mesh among all triangulations, which improves element quality, and they provide smoother linear interpolation than any other triangulation. Later on, we'll also see that Delaunay triangulations ensure that our Laplacian has non-negative cotan weights, which leads to many other benefits. There are many equivalent definitions of what it means for a triangulation to be Delaunay. Indeed, several of the properties that I just mentioned can be used. But for now, it'll be easiest to use the following definition. A triangulation is Delaunay if, for every edge, the sum of the opposite angles is at most pi. In our two triangulations from the last slide, the Delaunay triangulation satisfies this constraint at every edge, while the non-Delaunay triangulation violates it at a ton of edges. Importantly, given any set of points, such a Delaunay triangulation always exists and is unique if the points are in general position. And moreover, it can be found by a very simple edge flip algorithm. Here's the algorithm. If your mesh contains a non-Delaunay edge, flip it and repeat. That's it. That's the entire algorithm. Note that if we start with a non-Delaunay edge, where alpha plus beta is greater than pi, then flipping must produce a Delaunay edge as the four angles of a quad have to sum to two pi. So Lawson's algorithm just says that you can greedily fix any non-Delaunay edge that you find, and you will always end up with a Delaunay triangulation eventually. I should note that there are plenty of faster algorithms for computing Delaunay triangulations in the plane. However, at the moment, Lawson's classic algorithm is the most straightforward to generalize to the intrinsic setting. And the performance of the flip algorithm is perfectly satisfactory in practice. We'll go into more details later, but generally flipping to Delaunay takes less time than reading a mesh from disk. Now let's return to talking about intrinsic triangulations. In the intrinsic setting, we can use the exact same definition. An intrinsic triangulation is Delaunay if every edge has opposite angle sum at most pi. Amazingly, every surface mesh has an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, and it's generally unique just as in the plane. Moreover, we can compute these intrinsic Delaunay triangulations by running the exact same flip algorithm. And importantly, intrinsic Delaunay triangulations retain most of the desirable properties of their planar counterparts. For example, they still maximize the minimum angle and provide a smoothest possible linear interpolation of values at vertices. This same idea does not work at all in the extrinsic setting. First of all, the connectivity of an extrinsic mesh is tightly coupled to its geometry. In general, we cannot change the connectivity like this without corrupting that geometry. And even if you accept this geometric distortion and try to run the flip algorithm anyway, it won't necessarily work. There are some meshes on which the extrinsic flip algorithm will not terminate at all. The fact that we can obtain intrinsic Delaunay triangulations is the first of many benefits that we obtain by working in this larger space of intrinsic triangulations rather than sticking with extrinsic meshes. Working in the intrinsic setting allows us to naturally port planar algorithms to work on surfaces. So now we've discussed what makes a mesh good and have an algorithm for making some good meshes. What can we do with them? Well, I hope I don't have to convince you that there are a ton of interesting things you can do with meshes, from scientific computing to geometric machine learning. We'll discuss more applications later on in the course, but for now I'll focus on a key tool common to these fields, numerically solving partial differential equations, or PDEs for short. PDEs describe many fundamental physical phenomena, and moreover, solving numerical PDEs is an essential part of algorithms in all of these applications. In particular, we will explore an algorithm from PDE-based geometry processing. The core idea of PDE-based geometry processing is that solutions to fundamental PDEs on a surface can tell you a surprising amount of information about the surface itself, even if you're not interested in any physics. As an example, we'll implement the heat method, which computes approximate geodesic distance along a surface by simulating short-time heat flow. Like many PDE-based methods, the heat method may give low-quality results if you run it on a low-quality mesh. Here, for instance, we try running the heat method on an anisotropic mesh with many long skinny triangles. This leads to a lot of distortion in our solution. We're computing a distance function and highlighting isolines, so the highlighted curves should be roughly circular and evenly spaced, which is not true at all on the input mesh. However, if we first flip the mesh to its intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, we obtain a far more accurate solution. We see here that mesh quality can dramatically change solution quality.
Now let's talk about some PDEs. The Laplacian, or Laplace operator, is a ubiquitous differential operator throughout physics and geometry. In the plane, it's simply a sum of second derivatives. One interpretation is that it measures the difference between a function and its average value in a small neighborhood. On surfaces, there are many equivalent definitions. In any case, it behaves quite similarly to the planar version and still measures some sort of deviation from the local average. Much as the smooth Laplacian is common in physics and geometry, discrete Laplacians show up in algorithms in all different fields, from simulation to graph algorithms to machine learning to geometry processing. Because of its utility across applications, some people like to refer to the Laplacian as a Swiss army knife. In physics, the Laplacian provides the basic model for a wide variety of physical behavior. For now, we're primarily interested in the heat equation, du dt equals Laplace u, which describes how heat diffuses through a domain. There's also the Laplace equation, which describes the equilibrium behavior of an elastic membrane, or the steady state behavior of long time diffusion. Functions which satisfy the Laplace equation are known as harmonic functions. They generally look saddle shaped like this, as they cannot have any local maxima or minima in their interior. And finally, there's the wave equation, which describes, well, the behavior of waves. And then, building on top of these elementary equations, one can construct linear elasticity models, the Schrodinger equation, and much more. When working on triangle meshes, we need to use a discrete Laplace operator. A very natural choice is what's known as the cotangent Laplacian. If we consider a piecewise linear function u on a mesh, then the Laplacian of u can be represented as another piecewise linear function given by this formula. We express the value of Laplace u at a vertex i as a sum over the neighbors of i, and essentially measure the average difference between the value of u at i and at i's neighbors. We weight these differences by some expression involving cotangents, and also have to divide the whole sum by a vertex area ai, which is just a third of the areas of the adjacent triangles. While this formula may appear mysterious, it arises quite naturally when working with triangle meshes, and has been derived and rederived countless times in many different contexts. It's often convenient to factor this expression as the product of two matrices. Laplace u equals m inverse times l times u, where l is the cotan Laplacian, and m is a mass matrix. These coefficients in the expression for l are known as cotan weights. If we want the Laplacian to really measure the average difference between ui and its neighbors, then these weights should better be positive. More on that in a moment. Note that the cotan Laplacian and mass matrix depend only on angles and areas, and hence we can compute them for any intrinsic triangulation. We can obtain many different intrinsic triangulations of a domain, and each one defines a different discrete Laplace operator. Unlike several other quantities that we care about, the discrete Laplace operator actually depends on the triangulation. Recall that the formula involves summing over the neighbors of a vertex. This is one of many situations where the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation is very special. It's precisely the triangulation which makes all of our cotan weights non-negative. This, in turn, has numerous benefits when we use the Laplacian in practice. For example, it ensures that the Laplacian will satisfy the maximum principle. Just as smooth harmonic functions satisfying Laplace f equals zero cannot have any interior extrema, discrete harmonic functions with the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian cannot have any interior extrema either. This is particularly useful when using the discrete Laplacian to do interpolation, a very common use case, as it guarantees that the interpolated values will be bounded by the input. Furthermore, the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian is canonical. Even if we have a non-generic surface which has multiple Delaunay triangulations, they all induce the same Laplacian. In summary, we've asked and answered three questions throughout this section. First, what is a mesh? Well, a mesh is an abstract connectivity combined with a concrete choice of geometry. This geometry may be extrinsic in the form of vertex positions or intrinsic in the form of edge lengths. Second, what is a good mesh? Well, we have three criteria which we want meshes to satisfy. They should be good geometric approximations of our surface of interest, they should have as few elements as possible, and they should have high quality elements. We talked about Delaunay triangulations as a simple class of meshes with good elements, although we'll discuss other measures of element quality later on. And finally, what can we do with a good mesh? Well, there are lots of examples, but we just specifically discussed numerically solving PDEs. We'll go into more depth about all of these ideas later, but first we'll go through a quick coding tutorial so you can see how these ideas all work together in practice. All right, now that we understand the basics, let's work through a hands-on coding tutorial to start getting a feel for what it's really like to implement algorithms with intrinsic triangulations. A quick overview of how this will work. 
Rather than just handing you some pre-existing software, we want to walk through the experience of implementing these routines from scratch yourself to really demystify intrinsic triangulations. The goal for today will be to implement intrinsic Delaunay edge flipping from scratch in Python. This will mean working through the gluing data structure, some basic geometric subroutines on intrinsic triangles, intrinsic edge flips, and then pulling this all together uh, to use intrinsic triangulations for the heat method for geodesic distance. All of the materials for this coding tutorial are available at the link below, geometry.cs.cmu.edu slash intrinsic. This includes a code skeleton that you can fill out as you go, a solution version of the code that has all the routines implemented, as well as some sample data that you can run the algorithms on. A few more low-level details. As I mentioned before, we'll be working in Python, in particular Python 3, mainly just because it's an easy-to-use and easy-to-read language to play around with some of these algorithms in. We will use a few packages in addition to the basic Python language, mainly for linear algebra and I.O. In particular, we'll be using NumPy, SciPy, Polyscope, and Potpourri 3D. And you can install these packages with the command given below, as always with the caveat that Python might actually be Python 3 or whatnot on your system. And of course, you can also install these packages using any other package manager that you might want to. This is just one example way to use Python. And by the way, actually for the whole first half of the tutorial, we only need NumPy. So if by chance you get unlucky and something crazy goes wrong installing one of these dependencies, uh, as long as NumPy works out, then you're good to go for the whole first half of the tutorial. And again, all of the materials for this coding tutorial are online at the link below. Uh, so definitely navigate to that URL and try it out as you follow along. So before we dive into implementation, I want to refresh a few of the basic data structures that are going to play a role in these algorithms, and then we'll start walking through methods one at a time. The first uh, important data structure that we'll be thinking about are the connectivity arrays that represent how the elements of a mesh are connected to one another. We'll always use array-based implementations of connectivity, and these arrays will always be zero indexed, at least within this tutorial. So remember, the first important array is a vertex face adjacency list, which is a listing of, for each face, the indices of the vertices that make up that face. So in our code, this will be an f by 3 numpy array of integers. And I've given an example of one of these arrays here. Remember that the ordering of the entries for each face is important because it determines the orientation of the face. We'll also work with the gluing map which is important because it tells us how the sides of each face glue together. So in our Python code, the gluing map will be an f by 3 by 2, so number of faces by 3 by 2 numpy array of integers. So you can think of the entries of this gluing map, while well, they're in correspondence with the list of faces, and for each side of each face, the gluing map tells you what side of some other face that edge is glued to. And we'll talk more about manipulating this array later. In addition to representing the connectivity of a mesh, we also need to represent its geometry. The most standard way to represent the geometry of a mesh is just by a location with each vertices, uh, a location of each vertex. So this will be a V by three array of positions. And we will use this array at least initially in our code because if we read a mesh as input, it's probably gonna have positions associated with each vertex. So this will just be a, a V by three NumPy array holding real values. But of course, the whole point of everything we're doing is the intrinsic setting. So that means right from the start, we're going to throw away these vertex positions and instead work, work only with edge lengths. Now, the most natural way to store edge lengths would probably just be as a, a vector of lengths where each entry in the vector is the length of one edge. But to keep things simpler for our tutorial and avoid the need to deal with edge indices all over the place, we're instead going to store the edge lengths in an f by 3 array, where each entry in the array holds the length of some face side. This means that each edge length actually shows up twice in the array. And then for any triangle we're interested in, for each of its face sides, we can easily get the length of those three face sides by just looking them up in the array, which we'll see examples of soon. Now I mentioned face sides there. And it turns out that thinking in terms of face sides is a really important concept to implement these algorithms. So when I say face side, I really just mean a side of some triangle. We'll represent face sides in our code as a Python tuple of in integers. So it'll be a tuple where the first element of the tuple is the index of some face, and the second element of the tuple is 0, 1, or 2, indicating one of the sides of that face. 
So for instance, if I have face 37 sitting here, then 37 comma one would refer to the leftmost face side of the triangle. A nice convenience of representing face sides like this in our Python code is that we can use them to directly index these arrays of data. So for instance, if I wanted to get the length of face side 37 comma one, that I could just index this lengths array L with the face side tuple, and this would give me the real value, which is the length of that face side. And this will be a common pattern in the algorithms we're about to start implementing. So now if you wanted to take some time to try to implement these methods yourself, this would be the time to do it. Again, you can go to this link down at the bottom to find all the materials in the course. And there's a nice little skeleton telling you each method you need to implement, what the inputs and outputs would be, and you could start trying to think through this on your own. In terms of how this presentation is going to go, we're going to work through these methods in order. And the major headings of the code will correspond to subsections of the presentation. So you can try this out on your own, and whenever you get stuck, come back to the slides, and I'll be walking through this here, explaining each method, how it works, why it works, and diagrams that help us understand what's going on. So now that we've got an idea of how this is all going to be set up, let's start working through these methods. We'll start nice and easy with some mesh management and traversal helpers. Our first routine is going to be a next side routine which given a face side of some triangle returns the next face side in a counterclockwise order. So for instance, if we were given this face side 37 comma one, we would want to output put the face side 37 comma two because it's the next one in the counterclockwise order. And to implement this, we'll just need to return a tuple where the first element, the face element of the tuple is the same as the face of the face side we got as input. And then the side index is just incremented by one, but modulo three to make sure we wrap back around from two to one. So that wasn't too bad. We'll use this as a helper function and a lot of expressions to come. Another similar helper function will be what we call the other function that uses the gluing map to return the neighboring face side in some other triangle. So again, looking at this diagram at the bottom, if we were given face side 37 comma two as input, we want to access the other side of the adjacent face. So that'll be 21 comma zero that we want as output. This is great because this is exactly the data that we said we store in our gluing map. So if we were to look at the row of the gluing map corresponding to face 21, then we would see that sure enough, it holds 37 two. And likewise, row 37 of the gluing map holds face side 21 comma zero. So we can use this gluing map to given one face side, get the neighboring face side in some other triangle. In code, this other helper function, which performs this operation, we'll just need to use the tuple to index the gluing map. However, if we do that on its own, it's going to return a, a length to numpy array, which is not so useful to us. So instead, we'll have a little Pythonism here where we wrap this in a tuple constructor that causes this function to actually output a tuple like 21 comma zero. So now we can use this other helper function to given a face side, get the adjacent face side in some other triangle. There's a few other simple uh, helper functions that are useful that we've already implemented for you. So I'm just gonna outline these real quick so that you know what they mean if they show up in other places. There's an n faces routine, which takes the face array as input and returns the number of faces in the triangulation. There's an n vertices function, which takes again the face array because we don't like working with the vertex array. So we're just going to take the face array as input. Uh, and it also returns the number of vertices in the triangulation. We'll want to use a sort rows function, which you'll see in action soon, that takes a matrix and sorts its rows lexicographically. So we've implemented that for you using a, a quick little NumPy incantation. And lastly, a sanity check routine that validates the gluing map, which we have as a resource to you if you ever want to make sure you haven't messed up the gluing map while implementing these routines. So now that we have some basic connectivity and mesh reversal functions, we can start implementing some geometric subroutines on our intrinsic triangulations, where the geometry is encoded by edge lengths. The first of these will just be face area. So as you see on the right, we have some triangle with three edge lengths, L, A, B, C, and we want to compute its area. Our tool here is just some elementary geometry, Heron's formula, which we can directly translate into code. First, we gather the three edge lengths, and then we apply Heron's formula in order to compute the area of that triangle. So this routine takes the edge lengths array and a face index as input and outputs the area of that one face. 
When we can compute the area of one face, we can then loop over all the faces to compute the surface area of a triangulation. So again, this routine will take the list of all the faces in the triangulation, the face array, as well as the length array as input, and will output the total surface area of the triangulation. So to do this, we just need to loop over all of the faces uh, in the triangulations. This is a loop from zero to the, to the last face index. And for each one, sum up the contribution from the face area subroutine we just implemented. This is nice because it's a little example of how we loop over the list of triangles in our code framework here. Another useful basic geometry routine is going to be the opposite corner angle. So this takes as input the list of edge lengths as well as some face side in some triangle and outputs the angle in radians of the opposite corner of the triangle. So on the right here, you see if we have our triangle and we get this face side, which might be 21, 1 as input, we want to know the corner angle of the opposite corner, which I've marked as theta here. We're going to do this again with some elementary geometry using the law of cosines, which relates the cosine of one angle of a triangle to all three of its edge lengths. And this will look similar to our previous routines. We'll, we'll first gather up all of the edge lengths of the triangle. And, and notice here, if you didn't see it before, that we're using the next side routine to, given one face side, get the next face side and then the face side after that. This is handy because it says whichever face side we've been given as input, we can locally label the three edge lengths as A, B, and C, and then use them in this law of cosines expression directly. So this next side routine is a very useful helper function for traversing around triangles, and we can use its output to directly index the lengths array. So once we've gathered up these three edge lengths, we just plug them into the law of cosines after manipulating the formula a little bit, and then take an arc cosine to get out an angle as radians as output. So this produces that opposite corner angle from the face side that we got as input. Our next basic geometry subroutine is going to be one called diagonal length, which as you see on the diagram on the right here, take looks at the diamond of triangles, so the two triangles adjacent to some edge, and computes the length of this dotted line, the length of the opposite diagonal of the two triangles. As you might guess, this is going to turn out to be an important subroutine when we start flipping edges in our triangulation. To break down the elementary geometry here, the, our strategy can be to take two of these edge lengths, u, labeled u and v, as well as these other two corner angles, which I've labeled as theta, and notice that these form a big triangle along with the dotted line whose length they're trying to compute. So we can once again just use the law of cosines to compute the length of this dotted line. There are many other expressions you could also use uh, to evaluate this quantity. I'm just showing one particular example that works that we used in the reference implementation. So as with previous routines, we'll start out by gathering up the various values. The first thing we do is to use the other subroutine, which given the face side that we take as input, finds the neighboring face side in some other triangle. So now we have one face side in each of these two triangles, and we can use our next function to get, get out these two lengths, as well as compute the opposite corner angles using our subroutine from before. Once we've gathered up these lengths and angles, the law of cosines, gives us the length of the diagonal that we were trying to compute. This is interesting too because the gluing map is actually showing up for the first time here because we have a face, we have a side of one face and we want to know something about the neighboring triangle. We want to kind of unfold across an edge. So our gluing map is really important to be able to get information about the adjacent triangle across that edge. Another important geometric subroutine because we want to work with Delaunay triangulations is this is Delaunay subroutine which takes as input the gluing map and the lengths array, as well as some face side of interest, which is really just our way of encoding an edge by giving one of the two face sides on that edge, and tells you whether or not that edge satisfies the intrinsic Delaunay property. And remember from before that one of many ways to characterize uh, whether or not an edge is Delaunay is whether or not the two opposite triangle corner angles sum to less than pi. And this definition is really easy to work with, because we've just written functions that allow us to find the triangle on the other side of the edge, as well as compute opposite corner angles. So we just gather these values together and test if they're less than pi. You may notice that we actually test if they're less than pi plus epsilon. So this makes the test conservatively succeed. And this turns out to be the behavior we want to do the right thing for co-circular quadrilaterals in some of our downstream algorithms.
So now we have a whole collection of mesh traversal routines and geometric subroutines implemented, but we implemented these in terms of our gluing map and edge length arrays. And if somebody hands you a mesh, they probably don't hand you these data. Instead, they would hand you just a list of faces and vertex coordinates. So in this section, we'll talk about some subroutines to initialize these edge length arrays and gluing map from the more standard common representations of vertex positions and face indices. So the edge lengths are the easy one. Remember that from before, we store our edge lengths not as just a list of one value per edge, but rather as a list of one value per face sides. So for each of the each side of each face, we store the length of that face side in an f by three array. To populate this array, we'll take as input the vertex coordinates as well as the list of faces in the triangulation and allocate an empty f by three array. Then simply iterate through the triangles and the sides of those triangles. And for each one, read off the two vertex indices of the edge, measure the length of that edge, and store it in the array. Now to build the gluing map, we need to work a little bit harder. And we're actually going to first start by running a small subroutine to help us build the gluing map, which takes as input two face sides and just glues them together. This is useful because our gluing map should always have the property that if face side one is glued to face side two, then face side two should also be glued to face side one. So it's useful to have a little helper function that helps us get that right. So again, we can use these tuples to directly index and assign to the gluing map. So this function can just take the gluing map and two face sides as input and store them uh, symmetrically in the gluing map. So with this helper function, we can now implement the actual logic of a bl build gluing map routine that takes as input a list of face vertex indices and outputs this gluing map data structure that has richer connectivity telling you for each face side what is the adjacent face side in some other triangle. There are many, many possible ways you could implement this. Essentially, you just need any routine that can recover for some face side what is the neighboring face side. We'll do this in a matrix-based representation that sticks with these simple array data structures we we're using thus far. So the algorithm I'm going to show here starts by building a particular matrix that has one row per face side. So this is gonna be a three F by four matrix. So each of the rows of this matrix corresponds to a face side and has four entries. Those four entries are the smaller of the two vertex indices along that edge, the larger of the two vertex indices along that edge, and then the index of the face and the index of the side within that face. Once we've assembled this matrix, we can just sort the rows of this matrix lexicographically. And what will happen is that the entries, the face sides we want to glue together will end up as adjacent rows in the matrix after sorting because they have the same vertex indices along their edge. So then if we see two face sides here, like 12, zero and 16, two, they're next to each other in this clever array we built, so we can just call our glue together function to glue them together. In code then, we'll start by first just building this matrix. So remember this is a number of sides, which is number of faces times three by four matrix. So we'll allocate an empty matrix, then loop through all of the faces in our faces array. And for each side of each face, gather together the smaller and larger of the two vertex indices and store those in one row of this matrix. Once the whole matrix has been populated, then we sort its rows lexicographically using the sort rows helper I mentioned before that we've already written for you, which just uses a little bit of NumPy magic to sort the rows of a matrix. And then we just walk down this matrix that has now been sorted. And for each adjacent pair of face sides, we glue the two of them together using our glue together helper. And lastly, we can call the sanity check I mentioned before to make sure we got the connectivity right. Now, this routine, as we wrote it here, definitely does not handle all positive cases you might throw at it. For instance, it's not even written to handle meshes with boundary. It assumes the input is always a manifold-oriented closed triangle mesh, but it's enough to get you started, and you could probably imagine how you might generalize this routine to handle a larger set of cases if you wanted. So now we have all of our key tools implemented. We have routines for initializing the data as well as helpful traversal functions and some geometric subroutines. So we can start doing interesting things with intrinsic triangulations. And the most basic and common task with intrinsic triangulations is to construct the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation using this Lawson's flip algorithm we mentioned previously. So the most important actionable routine here is a flip edge subroutine. 
which takes as input these two tri triangles and all the respective geometric and connectivity data and replaces one pair of triangles on the left with the opposite pair of triangles on the right here. And we specify which edge we want to flip as before by just specifying one of the face sides which is incident on that edge. This really is just a whole bunch of indexing and connectivity to get right. So what we do is we first need to gather up a whole bunch of data, basically everything labeled in this diagram. So we want to get the neighboring face side along the same edge as the one we took as input using our other function, as well as gathering together all three face sides of the two triangles that we're interested in. And then also getting the opposite face sides, these sort of outer neighboring face sides labeled six, seven, eight, and nine here that are in neighboring triangles. And then we also want to gather the four vertex indices amongst these two triangles, as well as the indices of the two faces that we're working with. So this code on the left just reads off all of that data from our data structures with the help of some helper functions. We also want to read off a little bit of geometric data. We want to get the length of the four edges along the outside of the diamond. And now we can call our diagonal length subroutine that we wrote before in order to compute the length of this new diagonal edge that we're going to be creating in the triangulation by doing an edge flip. So now that we've assembled all of this data together, we can just store all this data in the right places of our data structure to execute the edge flip. So this means first update, updating our face listing F. So storing the two new faces as triplets of vertices in the face listing. We want to update the gluing map which means saying, oh, these two sides should be glued together. So let's glue them together in the gluing map. Then similar, the outside of our new face F0 comma one needs to be glued to the face side S7 and so on here and so forth. We need to update the edge lengths. So not only do we need to store the new edge length we've computed because we created a new edge in the triangulation, but we also relabeled even the face sides which have the same lengths that already existed. So we really need to store all six of these edge lengths in our length array. And then lastly, we're just going to return the face side that corresponds to the edge we just flipped. So this is handy because as I mentioned, this edge flip operation relabels the face sides incident on the edge being flipped. So it's useful to return the new label we just assigned to it so that the caller can keep using it in their algorithms. There's one tiny detail I'm omitting here, which is you need a small extra step in the case of delta complexes with self edges. And we'll come back to that at the very end because it's just a, a one extra detail. So now that we have an edge flip subroutine, we can use it to flip edges in our triangulation until it satisfies the intrinsic Delaunay criterion. So we'll implement this by checking each edge or really each face sides because we like to use face sides to encode edges. If it's not Delaunay yet, then we flip it and we enqueue all of its neighbors for further consideration. So throughout this algorithm, we'll maintain a queue of all of the edges that might not be Delaunay that we need to check. And we'll start out by just walking through all of the faces and all of the face sides in our mesh and adding them all onto this queue to be checked for being Delaunay. Then our algorithm will proceed. Well, as long as there are any uh, face sides or any edges left in this queue that need to be checked, we'll get one of the edges. We'll check if it satisfies the Delaunay criterion using the isDelaunay function that we wrote. And if it doesn't, then we'll flip the edge. If it does satisfy the Delaunay criterion, there's nothing we need to do. But if it doesn't, we'll invoke our flip edge routine. And flipping a non-Delaunay edge always makes it Delaunay. So that edge is now definitely a Delaunay edge. But the neighbors, the neighboring edges on these two triangles, or the neighboring edges in the diamond, might have become non-Delaunay because of this edge flip. So we need to take all of the neighbors and push them onto this queue for further processing. And that's it. We actually have a mathematical proof that this algorithm always terminates. And this is what's so great about Lawson's flipping algorithm is that it's quite simple and this procedure always terminates with a Delaunay triangulation. So now we can run the code. We've implemented everything we need to do to construct intrinsic Delaunay triangulations. If you check out the code skeleton we provided, you'll see that there's first uh, some really simple inline test data, which is just a little shape with five vertices and one non-Delaunay edge. We also have a IO library, this Potpourri 3D library, which allows us to load some more interesting meshes from disk. So for instance, we have a handful of meshes included in the example data subdirectory, which you can load by uncommenting these lines here to, to run your code on. 
And there's also one more line you can uncomment at the bottom to load any mesh at all that you might have on disk, any OBJ, PLY, or OFF file, and try running our code on that. So here's on my machine, I ran this script, and it has a few extra lines in it that print some data about the mesh. And you can see what happened is that initially, running on our simple test mesh, it had five vertices and six faces. We computed the surface area, and it's not Delaunay. Running the intrinsic Delaunay flipping algorithm, my version prints out the number of flips that happen. Your version might not do that unless you uh, told it to do so. But it took one edge flip to make this really simple mesh Delaunay. And then afterwards, it has the same number of vertices and faces, of course. But the really amazing thing about intrinsic edge flips is that they also preserve the geometry. So we notice that the surface area is unchanged. And even better, it has the intrinsic Delaunay property. So you can go play around with this and also test this routine on some of the other meshes that we included for you. After running, this code is going to raise an error because it tries to run the second half of the tutorial, which we haven't implemented yet, but that's fine. We're about to go implement those methods and be good to go. There's one more loose end to tie up here, which is that our edge flipping routine needs one extra step in the case of a delta complex, if there's a self edge in our triangulation, which can happen in our intrinsic triangulations. In that case, what happens is that one of these outside neighbors, labeled here like S6 or S9, is actually also one of the face sides in the diamond that we're flipping. So S9 is actually one of the face sides inside our pair of triangles that we've drawn here, because one of these triangles has been glued to itself. And in that case, we have a problem with, with our edge flipping routine as written, because these face sides on the inside get relabeled by the edge flip. All we need to do to fix this is go through and update the labels accordingly. So if any of these outside neighbors like S6, S7, S8, S9 are actually one of the face sides that we relabeled by doing the edge flip, then we need to update the value of that variable to be the new label for that face side. And as long as we do this before updating the glue map, then our whole edge flipping routine will work correctly even in this case of a delta complex. So this is really exciting. We've implemented one of the core algorithms in intrinsic triangulations, constructing the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation totally from scratch. And hopefully this shows you that this is not really such a scary thing to do. It's actually quite straightforward and really very powerful. In the second half of the tutorial, we're going to see that power in action by applying intrinsic triangulations to a non-trivial algorithm. This will show us both what it looks like to work with these intrinsic triangulations when implementing numerical routines and doing finite elements and, and doing geometry processing, as well as showing us an example of how these intrinsic triangulations can improve the robustness of routines in practice. And in particular, we'll use an algorithm called the heat method for geodesic distance as our sample algorithm. And as before, remember that if you don't want to do all of this implementation yourself, you can always just run the completed tutorial code that's provided at the URL we gave before. So our example algorithm is going to be the heat method for distance, which is a fast PDE-based algorithm for computing geodesic distance on surfaces. The basic idea is to use short time heat flow to get the gradient of distance and then integrate up those gradients to get the actual geodesic distance. This is a nice test problem because it involves many standard operations on intrinsic triangles, like building the Laplace and mass matrices, as well as implementing divergence and gradient operations. This algorithm is very fast and quite simple, but because it is a PDE-based method, it's susceptible to triangle quality and can fail on low-quality meshes. And what we'll see is that this is greatly remedied by using intrinsic triangulations. All right, so the first important subroutine we need to implement the heat method for geodesic distance is to build the cotangent Laplacian, this Laplace matrix we've been hearing so much about. And remember that this is a V by V sparse matrix, where the off-diagonal entries are given by cotangents of corner angles, and then the diagonal entries are just the sum of the off-diagonal entries in the row. So to build this in our Python code, we'll first initialize an empty sparse matrix using the scipy sparse matrix representations, and then just walk through the faces of our triangulation, and for each side of each face, we will add the corresponding cotangent weighted entries to the appropriate row and column of the matrix. At the very end, when we return this matrix, we'll convert it to a compressed sparse row format for performance reasons. Notice that this is super easy to do in the intrinsic setting. After writing a few simple helper functions, we can build our Laplace matrix with a very standard for loop over triangles and don't need any special crazy implementation for intrinsic triangulations or anything like that. It's just a triangulation.
And just like we build the Laplacian, we can build a mass matrix, where here we need a lumped mass matrix, where each vertex has one third the area of the adjacent faces associated with it as a diagonal matrix. So once again, we just initialize an empty sparse V by V SciPy matrix, then walk through the triangles in our triangulation. And for each, we add one third the area of the triangle to the diagonal entries for each of the adjacent vertices. And finally, we return this again as a compressed sparse mo row matrix. For our next subroutine, we will have to make a small but easy tweak to work in the intrinsic setting. So usually we might think of a gradient of a function on a triangle mesh as a 3D vector in each triangle. But that doesn't really make sense in the intrinsic setting because our triangles don't sit in space. So in the intrinsic setting, what we'll do is represent gradient vectors in triangles in a little local 2D coordinate system that we define for each intrinsic triangle. And we'll define this coordinate system by just logically laying out the, each triangle in the plane like you see on the right. So one axis of our coordinate system will be aligned with the zeroth edge of the triangle. As always, computing the coordinates of the vertices in this local layout is super easy. We just gather a few geometric quantities, so the length of two of the edges as well as one of the angles. And then we construct the position of the three vertices in this layout via some elementary geometry. It turns out for our algorithm, what we need to know about this coordinate system is the vector of some edge or some face side of the triangle. And that's what this routine will actually return. So we can just take the difference of two vertex positions in this little local coordinate frame that we've established and use that to return the, the vector along this edge. So again, what's really happening here is that we want to work with vectors inside of triangles. And the way we're going to do that in the intrinsic setting is just by defining a little mini 2D coordinate system local to each intrinsic triangle. Then when we want to do something like evaluate the gradient of a scalar function, we can just use a standard expression for a piecewise linear gradient, but apply it in our little local 2D coordinate system. And I'm going to start moving a little bit faster through these functions because these are just direct translations of formula from the heat method paper. So here on the left, we have our Python code that for each face of our triangulation, given a scalar function at vertices, it computes the gradient of that scalar function represented in the local basis of each face. Another operation we'll need with these vectors is divergence. So here's a similar routine that, again, just uses piecewise linear scalar functions in triangles. And given these vectors represented in a local basis in each face, computes the divergence of the vector field at vertices. So now we have all of our numerical ingredients to implement the heat method. The heat method will take as input the connectivity and geometry of our triangulation, as well as a source vertex which we want to compute the geodesic distance from. Now again, if you're really interested in how and why this algorithm works, I'd suggest you go check out the paper. Uh, but what we're going to do is just see how we can apply all of these intrinsic subroutines we've implemented in order to quickly walk through this algorithm. So first, we'll build these Laplace and mass matrices, again, just from connectivity and edge lengths, compute the mean edge length in the triangulation, which is a useful numerical parameter, and build a linear operator, which evaluates heat flow. We'll need some initial conditions for that operator to implement the algorithm, which is just a delta function at the source vertex. And then we can use another sparse solve to evaluate a single backwards Euler time step on this heat operator. The next step of the heat method is to compute gradients and normalize them, solve for the function which has those gradients to get out distances. And finally, because they're only determined up to a constant, shift the distances to be zero at the source vertex. And this is the whole heat method for geodesic distance. And it's quite easy to implement given all of these subroutines that we've built up thus far. I think the important thing to notice here is that running the heat method on an intrinsic triangulation looks almost exactly the same as it would on a standard triangle mesh. There's really nothing different going on here. At most, we just need to make tiny changes in order to compute geometric quantities from edge lengths. Now, if just as before, you run this code on the example data we've given you, which you can do again by just running the script and optionally commenting or uncommenting uh, the loading lines we saw in the previous example. Well, if we run this on original poor quality triangulations, like the terrain mesh, which we included in the example folder, it gives out basically nonsense because this mesh has some skinny anisotropic triangles in it, which cause the PDE solution to be very inaccurate. 
But if we just perform our intrinsic Delaunay edge flips first and then run the exact same algorithmic code, the exact same finite element problem, we get out a much higher quality solution, a much, much more accurate distance function. Again, the really big deal here is that the exact same code now computes this better solution. We didn't have to change the algorithm at all. All we did was flip to Delaunay before applying that method. So as we start wrapping up on the tutorial section of the course here, I want to mention a few things you might do if you wanted to push farther on these implementations. You could start working with some more advanced data structures to encode the correspondence between an intrinsic triangulation and the original triangulation, which lets you do things like extract the common subdivision, as well as implement operations like refinement beyond just edge flipping. Remember that here we use this gluing map, but really you can do everything we just did with any rich mesh data structure. You just need to be able to do edge flips as well as encode meshes which might have self edges in them. You might also notice that we use some pretty naive numerical expressions, like some arc cosine operations in this implementation, which, as you'd probably guessed, you can work around with some more careful numerics. And also, even these routines were still pretty fast as we just implemented them, but they're 100 times slower than they need to be because we implemented them in pure Python for loops. So it should go without saying that a more mature implementation in a lower level language like C++ would be orders of magnitude faster than what we just coded up. If you are interested, in some more fully featured packaged software that's ready to go, you should check out this Geometry Central library that we've written, which I've linked below, that can contains some very polished implementations of intrinsic triangulations, these higher order representations, as well as a whole suite of algorithms that plays nice with intrinsic triangulations. So this is where to go if you want to just use these directly in practice, rather than having the learning experience of implementing them yourself. I hope that this was an informative exercise, and now Keenan's going to take back over with a deeper dive into some of the core concepts of intrinsic triangulations. Okay, so in this next section, I'm going to talk in more detail about some of the theory of intrinsic triangulations, so basic definitions all the way through some fundamental data structures and algorithms. So in this segment, we're really going to dig down and answer the question of what is a mesh? And there are a lot of different answers to this question, which we're going to revisit from the intrinsic point of view. So for any kind of mesh, we need two basic pieces of data. We need connectivity, something that tells us how elements are connected up. And there we're going to need to generalize beyond kind of the basic vertex face adjacency list that you might see in a lot of mesh data structures. We also need some description of the geometry, which we're going to do something, again, unusual. We're going to replace ordinary vertex positions of our mesh with just the edge lengths. And we'll see that we can actually still do a whole lot of geometry just with that data. Uh, optionally, we'll store one additional and very important piece of data, which is something about the correspondence between different triangulations, between, let's say, an initial mesh and one that's been operated on, that's been remeshed in some way. Okay. Any mesh data structure must also support some set of atomic operations, so things like edge flips, edge splits, vertex insertions, and so forth, and we'll see how to do that in the intrinsic setting. And we'll wrap up with a discussion of something we can do with these mesh data structures, which is to construct a Delaunay triangulation and a Laplace operator, which are going to be key components of a lot of the algorithms we'll discuss uh, in the next section, and a lot of algorithms that are used in intrinsic geometry processing. So the key idea overall is that by broadening our definition of what a mesh is, we're going to be able to sidestep a lot of fundamental challenges that we're used to dealing with and struggling with in meshing and mesh processing. Okay, so let's start by talking about this first piece of data, the connectivity that says how our mesh elements are joined up together. And right off the bat, we should say that the connectivity of an intrinsic triangulation can be very strange because intrinsic triangles can kind of wrap around a polyhedral surface. So here's just one little example to give a sense of the kind of things that can happen. We have this intrinsic triangulation, so the, the dark black edges are the edges of our intrinsic triangulation sitting on top of this ordinary extrinsic mesh, this kind of octahedron. Okay, and we can focus just on this one triangle on the top that I'm shading in dark blue. A little hard to see here, so let's look at this from the top. And you look at this and you think, you know, is this even really a triangle? I mean, it doesn't really look like a triangle in the sense that I'm used to. Well, for one thing, if we trace out the, the edges, we notice, okay, we have an edge that goes from I to J, and then 
around the top, we go from J back around actually to J, already pretty strange. And then we go from J back to I. Okay, so you might question, is this really, does this really count as a triangle? But one thing we could do is we could cut along the dark black edges and unfold this figure into the plane and we would discover that those three paths that we went along on the surface really do trace out an ordinary triangle in the plane. Okay, or maybe we could draw it this way instead. We kind of smooth out the original extrinsic edges so we are just looking at the intrinsic edges and we say, okay, we have this kind of more interesting uh, abstract connectivity for our intrinsic triangulation. So how can we talk about this more formally? How can we really talk about what a triangulation is in this sense? Well, in general, there's an idea of a topological cell complex. So a topological cell complex, which will denote K, describes how elements of the mesh are connected. For instance, a really simple example is a graph. A graph has vertices V and edges E, and the edges just say which vertices connect up. Right, to form these, these segments. One thing that's really, really important when we talk about topological cell complexes is that the drawings that we see are really just drawings. Right? For a graph, I could put the nodes in different places, I could make the edges longer or shorter, but this really isn't changing the graph, it's just a different way of depicting it. Right? We also know that there are several different ways we could store or encode the connectivity of this graph. We could store an adjacency list, we could store an adjacency matrix, and so on. Right? So the type of complex we're working with isn't strictly tied to the data structure we use to represent it. There are lots of different kinds of cell complexes that are used to describe surface meshes. Maybe most common is a simplicial complex. There's also something called a CW complex. For intrinsic triangulations, it's going to be sufficient and often necessary to use a so-called delta complex. Okay, but let's first talk about kind of a more basic kind of complex, a simplicial complex is a very, very common way of describing meshes. So if we want to be really formal about it, we could say a simplicial complex is a collection of subsets of vertices closed under the operation of taking subsets, right? So this mesh that we see in the upper right would be not only the triangles IJK and IJL, but also the edges IJ, IK, IL, JK, JL, and the vertices IJKL, right? All the sets of all dimensions. Um, like a graph, the simplicial complex doesn't encode anything about the geometry, right? You can see that just by looking at this list. Where would the geometry be stored, right? And so there are many, many different ways we could draw the same simplicial complex. Just as a matter of nomenclature, subsets of size n plus 1 are called n simplices. So a 0 simplex is a vertex, a 1 simplex is an edge, a 2 simplex is a triangle. Okay. Um, a really key feature of a simplicial complex is that the vertices of any simplex must all be distinct. Right? Because this, a simplex is a set. A set has distinct elements. Okay, And because of this, it's going to be impossible to encode certain kinds of triangulations. Right? We're not going to be, in particular, able to encode the connectivity of all intrinsic triangulations. Let me, give, let me give just a couple examples. So here are a couple examples of triangulations that can't be described by a simplicial complex. Something that sounds pretty reasonable topologically is we want to take a triangle and glue it to itself along an edge. Right? So this equilateral triangle now becomes topologically this cone. Well, if I were to try to write this out as a simplicial complex, I'd have something like this, right? I'd have a triangle IJJ, and then I'd have three edges IJ, IJ, JJ, and then two vertices I and J. Well, the problem is, for one thing, I've repeated vertices in this triangle at the top, and I've also repeated the same edge twice, right? So it's not really something I can do with a, with a set, with a simplicial complex. Similar Example is I have these two triangles and I've split this square across the diagonal and now I want to glue all four vertices together to a single vertex. I want to glue the left edge to the right edge and the top edge to the bottom edge to make a torus. If I try writing this out as a simplicial complex, it just looks ridiculous, right? I have I, 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 I. There's no way if I just gave you this list, you could make sense of it. And in fact, this same list actually describes other 
uh, topological spaces, not just the torus. So the Klein bottle, the projective plane, right? So this is not a useful description of our connectivity. And the reason why we care about this is that similar features like an edge glued to itself can and do arise in intrinsic triangulations. We have to be able to represent these kinds of configurations in order to be sure that our algorithms will always work. Okay. So what we're going to work with instead is this thing called a delta complex. A delta complex is going to allow simplices to be glued together in more general ways. In particular, it doesn't require the vertices of a simplex to be distinct. Okay. So for instance, we could take these two disjoint triangles, I0, J0, K0, I1, J1, K1, and we could identify the vertices. So I1 with I0, J1 with J0, K1 with K0 to get a figure like this. Okay, so now I have two triangles with the same three vertices. So it doesn't require the vertices of the simplex to be distinct. It also doesn't require that we have only one simplex with the given vertices. Okay, here's our other example. We have these two triangles. Right? Now we're going to glue the edges together rather than the vertices. So I0, K0 to I1, K1, I0, J0 to J1, K1, and so forth. And that'll let us describe this torus. A good way to think about a delta complex for surface meshes is that we, again, we start with a collection of disjoint triangles and we specify how the vertices and edges get glued together. If you want a more formal definition than that, that's not very formal. Um, there's a nice one in, in Hatcher, um, but just keep this mindset, right? A delta complex is really just a collection of disjoint triangles and some data that tells us how to glue those triangles together along their edges and vertices. Now, you probably start to get a sense that the connectivity of a general delta complex can get quite complicated. And so we're gonna often, but not always, make two simplifying assumptions. First, we're gonna assume that we're working with a manifold. Okay, and one way to say this for something made out of simplices is that every interior edge is contained in exactly two triangles and every boundary edge is contained in exactly one triangle. Okay, so this is a manifold edge, but this is not because it's contained in three triangles. Likewise, an interior vertex is contained in a single loop of triangles. A boundary vertex is contained in a single fan of triangles. So this is a manifold interior vertex. This is not a manifold interior vertex because it's contained in two distinct loops of triangles. Okay. We're also going to ask that our mesh, at least for the purpose of this course, to keep things simple, is orientable. So orientable meaning that uh, neighboring triangles have consistent orientation if the vertices of the shared edge appear in the opposite order, so IJK and JIL have the same orientation, whereas IJL and IJK do not, okay? And the triangulation is orientable if it's possible to simultaneously assign consistent orientation to all of the triangles. So here's an orientable triangulation, here this Mobius band is not, okay? Later on, we're gonna talk about a construction called the tufted cover, which will help us run uh, manifold algorithms on non-manifold uh, triangulations, but for now we're going to keep things simple. Okay, so concretely, now that we know what kind of complex we want to work with, how do we encode that as a data structure? Well, again, a very common data structure used in mesh processing, something that people like because it's very conceptually simple, is something called a vertex face adjacency list. Okay, what does this mean? It just means for every triangle we say what its three vertices are. This is memory efficient, it's a nice dense array, but it has a major shortcoming for the kinds of things we want to do, which is that effectively it just says how to glue vertices together and not edges. Okay, so for instance, let's say we have this vertex face adjacency list, and obviously it looks kind of funny. It looks like I've just repeated the same triangle four times. So what could this possibly describe? And the trouble is, that this same vertex face adjacency list can describe many different spaces, right? So maybe the first thing I should do is I'll just draw out the four disjoint triangles, okay? I know that all four triangles have vertices one, one, and two. Well, how could I start gluing those together? Okay, well maybe that vertex two, it all meets in the middle. Right now I have this square and, and I know that uh, I could glue these ones together to make a cylinder or maybe I could keep gluing and I could glue together that tube in a couple different ways. I could glue it into a torus, uh, 
or I could glue it into a Klein bottle, or I could go back and I could glue all four copies of those, the, the vertex one together, but just make it into a single vertex, okay, without gluing the edges together. All of these things on the bottom, the torus, the Klein bottle, and this kind of dumpling, they all have the exact same vertex face adjacency list. There is no way to distinguish these three shapes based on the vertex face adjacency list. And what that tells you is we need a richer data structure. Basically, to unambiguously encode connectivity, we need more than just to know how the vertices are glued together, we need to know how the edges are glued together. We need some kind of edge-based data structure. There are a lot of different possibilities for this. So you could use signed incidence matrices, you could use half edge, you could use winged edge, you could use quad edge, you could use a corner table. All of these things have trade-offs, pros and cons. For the purposes of this course, we're gonna to stick to a conceptually simple data structure that you've already looked at, which is this edge gluing data structure. Now, when it comes to real code uh, that, that does a lot of interesting things with intrinsic triangulations, uh, we've found that actually sticking with a, an efficient array-based version of half edge, what we call a multi-edge data structure, uh, really works quite well. It's very, very efficient, just as efficient as working with a vertex face adjacency list. Um, but to just keep our descriptions simple for this course, we're gonna stick with this edge gluing table, which is just kind of an ordinary array, right? So remember that the basic idea of a delta complex was to say we want to imagine we have a disjoint collection of triangles and then know how to glue them together along vertices and edges. Well, for a manifold triangle mesh without boundary, actually it's gonna be enough to just specify the edge gluings. We don't need to worry about the vertices. Okay, just something like this. So our edge gluing data structure can just be a standard vertex face adjacency list, just as we've always done, plus some additional data, plus a gluing map that makes it very explicit for each side of each face, what side of what face should it be glued to? All right, we're not gonna leave this up to chance. We're not gonna have this ambiguity that we saw before with just the vertex face adjacency list. We're really gonna say how everything is glued together. Now, a nice thing about this data structure is both of these are just ordinary dense arrays or matrices. So if you're working in an environment like Python or MATLAB or whatever it is you like, it's very easy to implement. It's also possible, though we won't do it, to extend this idea of a gluing map to boundary edges, non-manifold edges, and so forth. Uh, in fact, this data structure is quite similar to data structures used in three-manifold topology to describe some pretty uh, complicated spaces. Okay, so that's it for connectivity. How do we talk about the geometry of our mesh? Well, what we really wanna get a feel for is the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic geometry. So if we think about smooth surfaces, extrinsic geometry is something like a parameterized surface. I'm saying for each point of a region in the plane, where does it get mapped to in space? Right? This really depends on how things are sitting in space. The other picture is a little more abstract. If you haven't seen it before, it can be a little hard to get your head around this idea of an intrinsic description of geometry, something that in differential geometry is called a atlas, an atlas describing a, a Ramanian manifold. And this description depends or talks only about essentially point-to-point -point distances along the surface. You have no idea how this thing is sitting in space, but you can still measure quantities like how far is it from point A to point B or what's an angle between two vectors and so forth, okay? Um, why would we work with this strange intrinsic picture? Why is this something people have done in, in smooth geometry? Well, the intrinsic picture enables you to work with geometry without having to know or worry about how it's embedded into space. And this can be a, a big, kind of liberation. So there's some perfectly reasonable geometries that are hard or impossible to embed in Rn for a fixed uh, given n, right? So example from smooth geometry is this flat torus, the square that if you walk off one side, you appear on the other. Okay, that's a perfectly reasonable geometric space, but try drawing it in three-dimensional space without distorting the, the distances. It's really, really hard to do. Uh, in the discrete case, maybe a more concrete example is, how about this tetrahedron? So I have these four triangles in the plane, right, with vertices I, J, K, and L, and I've marked how they should get glued together. 
And just like the torus, where I can walk off one side and appear on the other, I could walk off you know, an edge with three marks on it and appear on the other edge with three marks on it. Perfectly reasonable geometric space, but I just can't happen to glue those edges together in three-dimensional space. I have these short little flaps that don't quite come together, right? And so what this hopefully tells you is that intrinsic descriptions of geometry actually provide a strictly larger space to work with than a standard extrinsic triangle mesh. So maybe intuitively you could imagine this is kind of a, a relaxation of our usual notion of a triangle mesh. And this really will serve as kind of a relaxation in algorithms. Things that were hard where I had to know the embedding at every step of my algorithm, now I can just work with this kind of looser intrinsic description and I have a lot of more freedom and flexibility. One way to look at these different kinds of, of triangulations is sort of a hierarchy. So we could start with our kind of ordinary familiar extrinsic meshes, right? Triangles with vertex positions in R3. And we could then allow ourselves to cook up a different kind of triangulation where we trace out edges over this extrinsic mesh, right? As long as we trace out triangles that don't have vertices on their interior, then we can still always unfold these triangles into the plane, okay? So we have these what I'll call geodesic triangulations, ones that are traced out over some existing surface. And once we're in the plane, we can think, well, you know, I don't even need to know where or if these planar triangles came from some extrinsic surface as long as their edge lengths match up, right? As long as length between G and F on one triangle is the same as G and F on the other triangle, well, then I can still make sense of it. And I walk off one edge, I walk onto the other edge, okay? So this is still all a bit abstract. How do we actually encode it into a data structure? So, so far we've just defined the mesh connectivity, um, but we can also associate some different data with our topological data structure to encode either extrinsic or intrinsic geometry, right? So we, I could store positions, coordinates for each vertex, that would give me a standard extrinsic triangulation, or I could store edge lengths with my topological mesh, and that would give me an intrinsic triangulation. And in fact, we're often gonna have both on different triangulations of the same domain. So the standard picture, the standard extrinsic picture is that the geometry of vertices is given by vertex coordinates, let's call them PI and RN. And if I want to extend this geometry to edges and triangles, I do that via barycentric interpolation. All right, so I can write any other point in the triangle as a linear combination of the vertices where the coefficients T sub I of the linear combination are between zero and one and sum to one. Okay, so these are called the barycentric coordinates. And if I think about the set of all barycentric coordinates, all valid barycentric coordinates, that defines what's called the standard simplex. Okay, so a good geometric picture of what's going on with a, an ordinary mesh is, okay, I start with my purely uh, topological data structure, giving me the, the connectivity. To each triangle, IJK and JKL, I associate a copy of this standard simplex. Okay, and then that standard simplex gets mapped into, the, into space by pulling the vertices to the vertex positions. All other quantities that I want to compute, I can easily derive from the vertex positions, right? If I want to compute an area of a triangle, maybe I take a cross product and so forth. Okay, we're gonna do something different in the intrinsic case. So we're gonna throw away these vertex positions and instead store only the edge lengths. And in order for these lengths to describe well-defined triangles, well, they have to be, for one thing, positive numbers and for another, they have to satisfy the triangle inequality. Going from I to J and then to K must be a longer path than going straight from I to K, okay? So conceptually, we're gonna then glue together disjoint triangles along edges to define a global intrinsic geometry. So again, we start with our abstract connectivity. Each triangle independently, we can construct from these edge lengths and because neighboring triangles share an edge, they can be glued together at least locally while preserving these lengths, okay? And actually, just like the extrinsic case, all the other quantities that we care about, like areas and angles and so forth, are easily defined, derived from these, these edge lengths. Okay, we'll see that in a, in a moment. A really important perspective, though, when we're thinking about intrinsic geometry, 
is to say, well, what actually do we know about the shape? Right? So geometrically, an intrinsic triangulation describes what's called a polyhedral cone metric. What that means is that it has zero curvature at faces and also at edges. If I, if I look at an edge, well, it looks, you know, it looks sharp and creased, but actually I could take the two triangles at an edge and I could unfold them into the, flame, into the plane without any distortion. So there's really not any real curvature there. However, I can't do that at vertices. At vertices, there really is curvature, this kind of little cone that no matter what I do, I can't really flatten it out, okay? And so if I'm really thinking from the intrinsic point of view, the picture on the right is maybe a better representative of what's going on. If I'm walking around inside this surface, I can't really tell where the edges are, but I can definitely tell where the vertices are. And so what that means is, in some sense, this triangulation is completely superficial. As an intrinsic observer, I have no idea you know, which should be the, the, the triangulation associated with my surface. In fact, I could triangulate it another way. I could construct the same space out of a different set of triangles with a different set of edges. Right? Many, many different triangulations encode the same sort of cone metric. There's nothing at all special about the one that comes from the input triangulation. Okay, so to summarize, an intrinsic triangulation is gonna consist of connectivity, a surface triangulation, with vertices, edges, and faces, and a discrete metric, an assignment of lengths to edges. These lengths must satisfy the triangle inequalities, but importantly, the connectivity does not need to be simplicial, right? We can glue an edge of a triangle to another edge of the same triangle, or glue you know, all the vertices of a triangle together, and so forth. Okay. One thing you might wonder is, wait a minute, how do I get other quantities? If all I know is lengths, how do I get other useful information about the surface? Well, we just use standard formulas from Euclidean geometry. So if I have these three lengths, actually I can compute the angle using the law of cosines, I can use the uh, Heron's formula to get the area, and so on and so forth. Actually, you might wonder, well, where do these formulas come from? What if I, what if I need one that I don't, don't have? One thing you can always do is you can just take any triangle, take the three edge lengths, and construct it in Rn, right? And then read off whatever quantity you care about. So for instance, in 2D, you might put the first vertex at the origin, the next vertex at a distance equal to one of the edge lengths, and then you can sort of solve for the, the third vertex, cosine of theta and sine theta, where theta is again expressed using the kind of law of cosines. Um, another nice way to do this is to embed your triangle in three dimensions. So I'm gonna stick the three vertices along the three axes, x, y, and z. And a little formula, again, looking kind of like the law of cosines, tells me where to put these vertices. Um, this is a particularly nice embedding because now if I want to go back and forth between uh, these vertex coordinates and my barycentric coordinates, I just divide by the distance along the x, y, and z axes, okay? But however you do it, from here, it's easy to do things like read off the area, read off the angles, define the gradient, whatever you need to do. One last idea we'll need is uh, to talk about tangent spaces and tangent vectors on our surface, in particular at vertices. So remember that intrinsically, the neighborhood of every vertex looks like a cone. And so a way we can encode uh, a direction, a unit direction at a vertex is as an angle relative to some fixed reference direction E, which maybe we pick to be the direction of one of the edges. So to get the direction of each outgoing edge, we could, for instance, normalize the interior angle so that they sum to two pi, okay? And then take cumulative sums of interior angles. This reference direction, by the way, is gonna stay fixed for all time. So even if we're changing the mesh, flipping edges, whatever, we always have this kind of fixed coordinate system, okay? Why do we wanna talk about tangent vectors, and in particular, why at vertices? Well, this is gonna let us talk about something called the discrete exponential map, which is gonna be essential for kind of connecting one triangulation to another. So for a smooth surface, the exponential map says, okay, I'm gonna start at some point P, I have some tangent direction or tangent vector X, I'm gonna walk in the direction X by distance equal to its norm. On a discrete surface, it's the same idea, I'm at some point P, I have some vector U, I'm gonna just walk along the surface in the direction U, for a distance equal to the norm of u, okay? How do I actually implement this? Well, I intersect a ray with the edges of a triangle one at a time, right? Continuing down this kind of triangle strip until I get to my destination. 
Okay, and again, we're gonna need this exponential map to trace out edges of one triangulation over another. Okay, one just example of why this intrinsic viewpoint is useful is that real meshes, real data is often numerically very bad, close to degenerate. So a very common example would be um, if I have angles or lengths numerically close to zero, right? Or worse, maybe I violated the triangle inequality, right? What do I do? What does my geometry mean? So if you have these very degenerate or near degenerate uh, triangles, what you might do extrinsically is to perturb the vertex positions to try to fix it, right? I have this situation, so I wanna make the angles a little better, so I move the vertex. Okay, I made the bottom triangle better, but I made the top triangles worse, right? And it can be hard to find a scheme in general that always works. Well, in the intrinsic setting, actually, there's something stupidly simple we can do is we can just add a little bit of length to all of our edges, right? So we start out with this degenerate configuration. If we add enough length to all the edges while well, all of the triangles simultaneously become better. Right? There's nice ways to pick these numbers so that you really don't have to perturb things very much. Um, and this is kind of a simple strategy that's always guaranteed to work. Right? You can be sure that no matter how bad the mesh is that you put in, you get something with that's more than a certain tolerance uh, away from being degenerate. Okay, so let's talk about this third piece of data, which is correspondence, that's, that's gonna tell us how to connect an extrinsic triangulation to an intrinsic triangulation of the same domain, okay? So the bare minimum encoding that we have now for an intrinsic triangulation is basically just a list of edge lengths and some kind of topological mesh data structure that can at least encode a delta complex, right? So not a vertex face adjacency list, but maybe something like a half edge mesh or this gluing map. What can we do with this? basic data structure, is there anything interesting we can do with this, this basic data structure? Actually, the answer is yes. There's actually quite a bit we can do even with this simple setup. So our maybe most basic operation is an intrinsic edge flip, okay? So you've maybe seen an edge flip before. The idea is you take an edge and well, you connect it to the opposite two vertices. If you do this extrinsically, what you notice is in general, the geometry will change. In this case, we had this convex edge, it became concave. It kind of did damage to the original geometry. An intrinsic edge flip is not gonna work like this. Instead of connecting a straight line segment through space, we're gonna connect a straight path or geodesic path along the surface, okay? Which we can easily do if we're just keeping track of lengths and connectivity. And the key idea is an intrinsic edge flip does not change well the intrinsic geometry. How does this really work? Well, to flip an edge ij, what we're first gonna do is compute the length of the opposite diagonal from the known lengths. We're gonna update the connectivity, okay? And that's it, we're done. This edge flip, by the way, can only be performed under two conditions. First of all, the two triangles have to form a convex quadrilateral. Second, the endpoints of the edge that we're flipping have to have degree at least two. Why is that the case? Well, if we were flipping a non-convex quad, we'd kind of end up in a situation where we have the mesh folding over itself. And also, if we flip an edge that has a degree one endpoint, well, after doing that flip, we'd have an isolated cone point in the middle of a triangle. So we don't really have a triangle anymore. We can't explain it or describe it by three edge lengths, okay? So we'll see a bit later on, there are algorithms that are super useful that you can do just with this basic edge flip. But in general, we run into a problem, which is that after performing flips, we don't have any idea where the points of the new mesh sit on top of the old mesh or vice versa, right? The only thing we know is the new connectivity and the new edge lengths of this gray mesh, okay? And a problem is that without this additional correspondence information, computation on one mesh can't really help us out with solving problems on another mesh, okay? So for a lot of applications, we're gonna to need to transfer data between the intrinsic and extrinsic triangulations. And in some applications, in fact, we may need to also extract the common subdivision of these two meshes, okay? So our basic data structure is not enough. We need to somehow track this correspondence. And there are a few data structures that have been developed for this purpose. One is the explicit overlay data structure of Fisher et al. One is the signpost data structure of Sharp et al and one is the integer coordinates recently developed by uh, Gillespie et al. So let's take a look at, at these. 
One definition, by the way, that'll be helpful is the common subdivision. So given two triangulations of the same polyhedron, one extrinsic maybe and the other intrinsic, the common subdivision is a cell complex by, obtained by essentially slicing one along the edges of the other. Right? You could, if you like, triangulate this, but it's not really necessary. Okay. Now, for a lot of things we want to do, it's also not enough just to know S, the common subdivision. We also need to know which elements came from which triangulation, how they cross, how to transfer data between them, and so on. Okay. So the first data structure is what we'll call the explicit overlay. The idea is that at all times, we're going to keep track of every location where original and new edges cross, and we're going to explicitly store all this information in the common subdivision represented by a half edge data structure. Okay. In addition, we're also going to mark each segment of this common subdivision as either original, new, or both. The crossing locations are also stored in 1D barycentric coordinates. So what are some good things about this data structure? Well, for one thing, it provides this additional correspondence information that we were looking for. For another, it's guaranteed to have the right connectivity. All the decisions we make about how, how to update this data structure are based on quantities we know exactly. Uh, on the other hand, this data structure only supports one type of uh, mesh modification, which is edge flips. And in fact, these edge flips are not even done in constant time. It can also be very expensive to compute and store crossings at every step of processing. So kind of an extreme case is shown in the, the bottom right here, where we end up with order n squared crossings as we flip our, our edges around. Okay. So why is this so tricky? Well, let's think about how you'd implement an edge flip with an explicit overlay. So as with the basic data structure, we have to update our edge lengths, of course, but we also have to update the common subdivision to reflect the flip. So what that means is we're going to have to merge pairs of segments on either side of the edge to be flipped, this edge C, and then after we're done with that, we have to split again segments uh, along this flipped edge C prime. Okay, and merging and splitting of all these, these different segments also requires maintenance of half edges going around the faces. So quite a lot of work to do even just one edge flip. We also have to think about special cases, like what happens if we flip an edge uh, back onto an edge shared by both, both meshes and so forth. Um, however, because the new connectivity can be determined without using any geometric information, we can be sure that we always have the right connectivity. On the whole, even though this works all right for edge flips, it becomes pretty expensive and cumbersome to extend this approach to other operations like vertex splits and insertions and so forth. So a different thing we can do is to take inspiration from these signposts you see all over the world, uh, which kind of tell you how far and in what direction to walk to get to a particular destination. So likewise, the basic idea of the signpost data structure is to store at each vertex the direction and distance to each neighboring vertex. So this gives us a kind of an implicit description of the new triangulation rather than the explicit encoding by the common refinement. In more detail, this signpost data structure is going to store the usual topological triangulation, a list of edge lengths, but also the outgoing edge directions. So for each oriented edge, or what is commonly called a half edge, we can store the outgoing angle relative to our local coordinate system. We might also store barycentric coordinates of any newly inserted vertices. Okay, so unlike the explicit overlay, where we're changing the size of the mesh as we flip and so forth, the storage cost is now fixed. And we have crossings that can be lazily evaluated on demand by tracing out edges by walking along these signpost directions. Okay, but the, the good news is that we actually don't need to know where these crossings are anymore for most of our operations. Right? So the key idea of the, the signpost data structure is to maintain not only a description of length and distance, but also a description of tangent spaces. Okay. The key operation that this enables is the ability to, again, trace out intrinsic edges across the extrinsic mesh. So how do we do this? Well, we just use our discrete exponential map. So given an edge direction x and the length l at a vertex i, we just walk along the surface, tracing out this edge. Computationally, this just means we're doing a sequence of 2D ray edge intersections. Okay, so because we can trace out these intersection points whenever we like, what that means is we don't have to maintain them or keep track of them as we do other operations. So 
Let's say you want to do an edge flip with the signpost data structure. Well, then it's going to look just like the basic data structure, right? We flip the edge and we compute the new length, right? the length of the opposite diagonal. But we have to do one more thing, which is to compute the direction of the new edge at its two endpoints. And that can be done just by a little calculation involving the angles that can be computed, again, from the edge lengths. Okay. A more important thing that differentiates the signpost data structure from these previous data structures is that it gives the ability to actually insert new vertices in the mesh. Right? So, so far we've just been flipping edges, but keeping the same vertex set. So to insert a vertex, we can take advantage of this tracing operation. The basic idea is to say, okay, I have a new point I want to insert, this point I. So what I'm gonna do is, well, I know the direction from one of the corners of the intrinsic, the gray triangle to I, and I can trace out that curve along the extrinsic mesh until we find the extrinsic triangle ABC that contains that same point I, okay? So that's giving us the correspondence. Once we know where I sits in the extrinsic mesh, we can record the barycentric coordinates of that new point. We can insert topologically the new edges and faces in our intrinsic mesh, and we can get the new signpost angles by adding interior angles of our new triangles, which are computed by the new edge lengths. Okay, so you start to get a sense of how the game is played. And from there, there are a lot of other operations that you could implement, right? Splitting edges and moving vertices and so forth. But the same basic pattern is there. Right? You update the connectivity, compute new edge lengths, maybe update signpost angles using tracing and so forth. Right? And so you get little algorithms for each of these operations. But the really important point is that using these little atomic operations, you can build up now a full-blown intrinsic data structure that's a lot more feature compatible with a standard mesh. Right? All the local operations you'd expect to do on an ordinary mesh, you can do now on an, an intrinsic mesh. Moreover, in software, all of this complexity of working with an intrinsic triangulation can be hidden in a standard mesh interface, right? So just once ever, somebody has to implement routines for computing lengths and areas and angles. Once ever, somebody has to implement a routine for flipping an edge, inserting a vertex, moving a vertex. From there on out, a lot of algorithms that you're used to can be implemented as usual, right? So run through all the edges, do some flipping or you know, compute areas or whatever it is. One thing to always be cautious of is that all geometric data structures um, can struggle with floating point issues, right? So in theory, with this signpost data structure, we know the exact direction and exact distance to the neighboring vertices, and so we can just trace out curves using this discrete exponential map to find these edges and find these correspondences. Well, of course, in reality, we don't know anything exactly. We have floating point numbers representing all this data, and so floating point error can cause you know, a trace that should go from one vertex to another to actually fail. We don't reach our destination. Right? So this is something that might happen on meshes with extremely bad triangles, near zero areas, and so forth. The reason that that happens is, in those cases, these ray edge intersections are ill-conditioned, and you might make the wrong decision about where to go next. Okay, So ideally, we'd like some way around this. We'd like some way to be sure that the connectivity is always correctly encoded by our connectivity data structure. And so that leads to a different way of approaching connectivity, which is to use integer coordinates. Okay, So, so far we've seen two data structures, the overlay, which is very explicit and always gets the connectivity right, but is very, very expensive to maintain. And the signpost data structure, which is kind of implicit, it only stores a minimal amount of information, but it is prone to floating point error in these extreme cases. So a third possibility is to use a recent scheme of integer coordinates uh, developed by Gillespie et al. And this kind of gives the best of both worlds. On the one hand, we're gonna have the exact connectivity because we're only working with integer data. On the other hand, the encoding is still implicit. We're not storing every point where every edge crosses every other edge, but just kind of a minimal amount of information.
okay? And another way of saying that is that the, the representation is output sensitive. The work required to extract the final refinement is proportional just to the size of whatever we're extracting. The basic starting point is something called normal coordinates for curves. And the basic idea of these normal coordinates is to say, okay, if I just have a single curve crossing my triangulation, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count how many times does each edge get crossed by that curve. Right, so one, two, and so forth, and on every edge that I haven't marked, the number would be zero. Okay, so we have an assignment for, from each edge to some integer, and we have a very important restriction, which is that this curve is not going to be allowed to enter and exit the same edge of the triangle. It's a normal curve. Okay, this idea of normal coordinates was originally developed actually for normal surface theory. So surfaces, you can imagine intersecting tetrahedral meshes, and it has several different uses and perspectives. In topology, it's used to study all kinds of things, for instance, something called the mapping class group. So what are different ways I can map a surface to itself? And I can take this torus, I could twist it around and, and glue it back together. Well, that I can actually describe by a triangulation that experiences what's called a Dane twist, that takes this same kind of twisting. In theoretical computer science, normal coordinates are viewed as kind of a compressed representation of curves. So you can imagine they in can encode an extremely long curve that winds around the surface many, many times with far fewer bits that would be needed to explicitly store these curve segments. In geometry processing, these normal coordinates are going to help us uh, get a robust data structure for tracking intrinsic triangulations. And we're going to change a little bit the way that topologists think about these normal curves. We're always going to imagine that the curves are not normal curves, but are actually straight geodesic curves. And that's why they don't enter and exit from the same edge. One basic observation we can make is that as long as our curve doesn't stop or start at a vertex, the normal coordinates will always satisfy the triangle inequality. Right? So the sum of the normal coordinates on two edges is always greater than or equal to the third one. Why is that true? Well, at most, arcs that go into the first two edges can come out the third edge. Right, that's it. In general, we will allow curves to start and stop at vertices. In this case, two useful numbers are the number of edges leaving a given corner k, e sub k superscript ij, and the number of edges crossing the corner uh, k, c subscript k superscript ij. And you can see here the kind of flavor of expressions that show up when working with normal coordinates. Of course, these coordinates aren't very useful unless they can go in the other direction, right? We want to be able to recover the curves from the normal coordinates. So given just these numbers, we can start walking through some different cases. Okay, where could these numbers have come from? And there are actually just a few possibilities. Right? When we enter triangles, should we go left? Should we go right? Or should we just stop at the opposite vertex, uh, which we can translate into a little algorithm? This tracing procedure is purely combinatorial. It depends only on integer data. And so what that means is it only gives us a sequence of edges that are underneath the curve. To get the actual geometry of the path, what we can do is lay out the corresponding triangle strip into the plane, right? And then draw a straight line between the endpoints. That's it. And because we know with 100% certainty that the curve uh, passes through only these edges, we know the line will be contained in the strip. And so the worst thing that can happen is that we might have to clamp some of our intersection values to the range 0, 1 due to floating point error. Okay, But this is much, much better than what happened with signposts where we might fail to even reach the neighboring vertex. Right Here we have a, a hard guarantee that we will have a path between the two endpoints. Okay, so so far we've been using normal coordinates just to encode a single curve, but here's a nice observation. So if we have a union of a disjoint collection of normal curves, then they can be represented by the sum of their normal coordinates. Okay, another observation is that the edges of an intrinsic triangulation are disjoint geodesic arcs, hence normal curves. So we can actually encode an entire triangulation unambiguously with a single set of normal coordinates. Right, pretty amazing. Um, and we're gonna just store zero if the edges are contained in both triangulations, okay? So as with edge lengths and signposts, it turns out there's a nice little local formula we can use to update normal coordinates. 
okay, something like this. And in the simple case where no curve terminates at a vertex, this actually looks just like sort of a tropicalized version of uh, the Ptolemy formula for the lengths of a, a cyclic quadrilateral. So we replace uh, products with sums and sums with a maximum. And if we assume that these normal coordinates come from a triangulation, then we can generalize to the case where curves terminate at vertices. So this is pretty cool. We can flip edges, we can trace out curves, but it turns out that normal coordinates alone do not provide enough information for tracking correspondence between triangulations. For instance, after performing some flips, we might have two different edges with the same two endpoints here, I and J. So after tracing out a curve, we don't know which logical edge in the other mesh it belongs to. So a nice solution to this problem is to store some additional data called roundabouts. So the idea is to basically enumerate the outgoing edges at a vertex in counterclockwise order. And then each directed edge of the intrinsic triangulation stores the index of the next outgoing extrinsic edge. Okay, so these are called roundabouts because they kind of tell you where you need to exit on the, the roadway. And if you stare at this for a minute, you realize that these are actually um, kind of just combinatorial analogs of the signposts that we had before, right? They're giving a direction, but now that direction has kind of been quantized to be just one of these, these integer directions. Okay, pretty cool. Okay, so one final thing is that if we need to interpolate any intrinsic data over the extrinsic mesh or vice versa, like we have texture coordinates or colors or vertex positions or whatever, then we actually do need to, at the end, extract the common refinement or common subdivision of the two triangulations. So what we can do is trace out all the edges and then we get a sequence of crossings along each edge and actually it turns out that just from these crossings alone, you can unambiguously determine how segments and uh, polygons should be connected up, okay? And actually you can do this with either signposts or integer coordinates. The benefit of the latter is that the connectivity is always correct, right? The ordering of intersections is known uh, from purely combinatorial information, okay? So, so far with these integer coordinates, we've only done operations that keep the vertex set fixed, like edge flips. Very recently, Gillespie et al. generalized this idea to the case where new vertices can be inserted. And unlike normal coordinates from topology, the combinatorics after insertion depend in an important way on the location of the inserted vertex. Okay, but once you can do this, just like we did with the signpost, this enables all sorts of operations beyond edge flips like edge splits and vertex insertions and vertex removals and so forth. And also like the signpost data structure, these operations can then be encapsulated in a standard mesh interface. And now your code just looks like ordinary mesh processing code. Okay, so we've looked at a lot of different things, a lot of different data structures. Let's look at some of the trade-offs between these different options. Okay, so we had the explicit overlay where we really track the full common subdivision at all times. We had signposts where we just store the direction and distance to the neighbors. And we have the integer coordinates where we just keep track of how many times each edge in one mesh is crossed by edges in the other mesh. For one thing, these are very different flavors of data structures. The explicit overlay is explicit. It stores everything at all times. Signposts and integer coordinates are implicit. They sort of store a minimal amount of information, which not only makes them more memory efficient, but it means there's less to update as we process our mesh. Um, both the explicit overlay and the integer coordinates are exact in the sense that the connectivity is always correct. Signposts depend on floating point numbers and so they can get the answer wrong sometimes, although in practice this really tends to only happen in very extreme cases. A uh, really important thing is that to do even just a single edge flip with the explicit overlay, you might be doing kind of order and operations, whereas with signposts and integer coordinates, it's always a very local operation involving a fixed amount of data. Um, signposts and integer coordinates are able to implement operations beyond edge flip, or at least it's known how to do it. And also, we didn't really talk about it, but if you want to transfer uh, tangent data, which is useful for vector field processing, uh, signposts are a very natural data structure because 
you have a sort of coordinate system for tangent vectors, whereas in these other data structures, you don't. Okay, so no one data structure does it all. Probably the best thing would be something like a hybrid between signposts and integer coordinates. Okay, later on, we're going to see an empirical evaluation of the real world performance and robustness of these different data structures. Okay, I'm going to wrap up this section with a discussion of Delaunay triangulations, which is going to be kind of the gateway into all the other kind of global remeshing uh, that we do. So in the plane, a classic criterion for a triangulation to be good is that it's Delaunay, which traditionally means that a triangulation is Delaunay if there are no vertices on the interior of any triangle circumcircle. Okay, why is Delaunay good? Well, it turns out it coincides with a remarkable number of other properties. For instance, it gives the smoothest possible linear interpolation of data at vertices, it maximizes the minimum angle, it minimizes the Laplace and eigenvalues, and so on and so on and so on. A particularly nice property for scientific computing and geometry processing is that it guarantees positive edge weights for the discrete Laplace operator, which is absolutely fundamental to geometry and physics. Okay, so how do we generalize this Delaunay condition for triangulated surfaces in R3? Well, we can't just use the ordinary circumcircle condition anymore because the circumcircle sort of sticks out of the surface. It's not even clear what it would mean for a vertex to be contained or not contained in this circumcircle. So a classic extrinsic approach is to use what's called the restricted Delaunay triangulation. You sample the surface, you build a 3D Voronoi diagram, you find edges that cut through the surface, and then keep dual simplices, dual triangles. So this is in some sense still based on empty circumspheres, but there's no reason at all that this definition should retain all the same nice properties of planar Delaunay triangulation for the triangle surface mesh, right? Maybe for the volume mesh, but not for the surface mesh, okay? In fact, um, remember again that we want this Laplace operator to have positive edge weights. That's really important for a lot of uh, surface processing tasks. Well, this is going to hold for planar Delaunay triangulation, but actually not for restricted Delaunay triangulation, or in fact for any other kind of extrinsic Delaunay meshing strategy you can come up with. So optimal Delaunay or running TetGen or running TetWild, none of these actually guarantee positive edge weights for the Laplacian. Okay, so a more useful definition for surface processing is something called the intrinsic Delaunay condition, which is very simple. It says that for each edge, the sum of the two angles alpha and beta opposite that edge should sum to no more than pi. Okay, so this configuration is Delaunay, this one is not. This condition was originally studied by Riven actually in the context of hyperbolic geometry. Um, and in the Euclidean plane, it corresponds with the usual empty circumcircle condition. But importantly, it also makes sense for surfaces. We can just read off angles at corners and it even works in the intrinsic case because we can compute these corner angles directly from the edge lengths. By the way, this condition holds with equality when the two triangles containing the edge are concyclic, right? And so in this case, the Delaunay triangulation is not unique. We could flip the edge one way or another and satisfy this condition. Um, many algorithms you might try to use to construct Delaunay triangulation in the plane do not translate to surfaces. So efficient sweeping or lifting or whatever Instead, we need to go back to a simpler algorithm called Lawson's flip algorithm. This is just a greedy algorithm that says, keep flipping non-Delaunay edges in any order until all the edges are Delaunay. Okay, so if we have a configuration like this, we perform a flip, and at least that edge is now Delaunay. For the surface version of this algorithm, we're going to do the exact same thing, but we're going to use intrinsic edge flips instead. And a really useful fact is that you can always flip a non-Delaunay edge, even in these strange delta complexes. Right? So if an edge is non-Delaunay, that means it's contained in a convex pair, and both of its endpoints are degree at least two. An even more important theorem is that the intrinsic algorithm always works. Right? If I flip edges long enough, I'll eventually always get to an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. Okay? On the other hand, the cost is not as clear. So in the planar case, the worst case number of flips is order e squared. In the surface case, it's impossible to bound the number of Delaunay flips in terms of the mesh size. So you can construct triangulations that are arbitrarily far away from Delaunay in the flip graph. For instance, imagine applying Dane twist to this sort of cylinder. A 
sort of surprising observation, therefore, is that empirically, the number of flips you need for this Delaunay algorithm grows only like the number of edges in the mesh. And that's true, not just for nice meshes, but actually some really, really awful meshes. Why might that be true? Well, the, the basic intuition is that for an embedded triangulation, the length of the longest edge is bounded by the extrinsic diameter. So you can't have these crazy edges that wind around and around and around the mesh like we see in the upper right. And so an interesting open question is, can you bound the number of flips needed to reach Delaunay in terms of the geometry of the mesh rather than just the number of elements in the mesh? Okay. Um, one really important thing that we need the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation for is to define a nice Laplace operator. So yet again, the Laplace bill charming operator is fundamental in geometry processing and physical simulation algorithms. And we can come up with a canonical discrete Laplacian for a triangulated surface by first flipping to an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, then building the usual piecewise linear finite element stiffness matrix, which is called the Cotan Laplacian because the edge weights end up involving cotans of the angles, okay? And important fact is that we have non-negative cotan weights if and only if the edges satisfy this intrinsic Delaunay condition. Now, it turns out that even if we have one of these concyclic pairs, even if the Delaunay triangulation isn't unique, we still get a unique Laplace operator because in either case, the edge weight is zero. More importantly, we get a discrete maximum principle from this Laplacian, meaning if we are trying to interpolate data on the boundary, the interpolated values are always within the range of the given values. And that turns out to be really, really important for a lot of applications that are coming up next. Okay, to summarize all the things we've talked about in this sort of theory and background section, a purely intrinsic triangulation consists of two pieces of data, connectivity described by a delta complex, and geometry described by edge lengths. In many cases, however, we need both extrinsic and intrinsic data. And so what that means is we're gonna store two triangulations, let's say T1 that's extrinsic and T2 that's intrinsic. The extrinsic geometry is gonna be given as usual by vertex positions, the intrinsic geometry by edge lengths, and we're also gonna to need to store some kind of correspondence between these triangulations using, let's say, signposts or integer coordinates. Other important fact is, given any mesh, no matter how bad the mesh is, we can always turn it into a sort of good mesh by constructing this intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. And that can be done quite efficiently by just this greedy edge flipping algorithm. Okay, And that's going to be the first of several ways that we're going to look at to intrinsically remesh polyhedral surfaces. This intrinsic remeshing in turn facilitates all sorts of interesting applications that we'll talk about next. Okay, so that's it for the theory. I'm gonna pass it off again to Mark and Nick who are gonna talk about applications. Now let's talk about some ways in which intrinsic triangulations are effective for practical applications. This section will be grouped into three main areas. First, we'll talk about retriangulation schemes, which allow us to take an initial intrinsic triangulation and transform it into a high-quality triangulation to compute with. Then we'll see a particular algorithm for constructing geodesic arcs on surfaces using intrinsic triangulation. And finally, see how these techniques can be applied to a wide range of PDE-based geometry processing algorithms to improve both accuracy and robustness. So about these retriangulation schemes. Remember, the setting here is that we've defined a few data structures which support mesh processing style operations. These are things like edge flips, face splits, removing vertices, and so on. The basic idea is to use these operations to generate a high quality intrinsic triangulations to compute with. And generally our strategies will just be procedures from planar remeshing, which we've adopted under the surface case without much modification at all. It turns out that this intrinsic approach is fundamentally more powerful than extrinsic remeshing for a couple reasons. One big one is that it always exactly preserves the underlying geometry. An example of this is pre preserving small features in detailed geometry. Here's an example from some traditional extrinsic remeshing where a fast tet wild, which is a very powerful state of the art method, totally loses all of the important geometric details while remeshing the shape. In contrast, when we have the luxury of working in the intrinsic setting, this isn't even something we have to worry about, 
because we're working in a whole space of triangulations which all exactly encode the underlying geometry, at least in an intrinsic sense, which is enough to implement lots of useful algorithms. Additionally, intrinsic strategies can improve element quality in ways which would not be possible in an extrinsic setting. For instance, if you require yourself to exactly preserve the geometry in an extrinsic sense, in terms of how the shape sits in space, then you would never ever be able to do anything about these acute angles at the top tip of the shape. Any remeshing scheme would have to contain those angles in the output in order to exactly preserve the geometry extrinsically. However, if we instead exactly preserve geometry only in an intrinsic sense, then we get the freedom to retriangulate and improve these skinny angles, like the intrinsic result given by the colored triangles that you see here. The most basic intrinsic retriangulation scheme that we've already heard about is Delaunay flipping, where we use edge flips to find a triangulation which satisfies the intrinsic Delaunay criterion. Now, we mentioned earlier that there are a lot of other similar sounding notions of Delaunay that get used in the context of surface meshes, but the important fact is that none of these carry over the properties of planar triangulations to surface meshes. What we see here is that all of these notions fail to give the non-negative cotangent weights that we want to have in the Laplace matrix. On the other hand, there are other construction schemes that you might use to create triangulations which do satisfy the same Delaunay criterion that we consider here. So rather than taking an intrinsic viewpoint, these methods operate extrinsically, maybe splitting edges or refining faces. But remember that constraining oneself to preserve the extrinsic geometry makes the problem fundamentally harder. Here we see this in action, where we generate a Delaunay triangulation of this CAD model. Using an extrinsic scheme, like we see on the left, we have to massively increase the vertex count and create some skinny triangles in the triangulation uh, in order to satisfy the Delaunay property. Whereas on the right, with our intrinsic Delaunay edge flips, we preserve the concise element count and also improve element quality while doing so. The intrinsic approach is really the way to go. And we mentioned the complexity of this algorithm before briefly, but I want to reiterate that in practice, it's extremely fast. In theory, there are only pessimistic worst case bounds on the complexity of this intrinsic Delaunay flipping procedure. But in practice, we consistently observe it to run in essentially linear time, even on difficult inputs. Here's an experiment where we took every mesh in the Thingy 10K repository of challenging 3D CAD models, and for each one we plot on the x-axis the number of edges in the model, and on the y-axis the number of flips that it took to make it Delaunay. The trend is extremely linear, and there are no outliers where the number of flips is dramatically more than a small factor of the number of edges. Generally speaking, these Delaunay edge flips take less time than just reading a mesh from disk, usually just a few milliseconds, even on pretty large models. But we can also push it farther than Delaunay edge flips, and in particular, we can perform intrinsic Delaunay refinement. And the key idea here is to insert new vertices to avoid skinny triangles in the triangulation, or to achieve some desired vertex distribution. The algorithm here is once again an algorithm from planar geometry known as Chu's second algorithm, where we simply alternate between flipping the triangulation to be Delaunay, and then inserting a vertex at the circumcenter of some skinny triangle, or a triangle which is larger than we want it to be. This procedure will eventually terminate with triangulations which satisfy a minimum corner angle bound of up to 30 degrees. This is really great because this is an awesome mesh to do simulation on. It has the Delaunay property, no skinny triangles, a good distribution of vertices, we can build it in a fraction of a second, and all of this while it exactly preserves the geometry of the underlying domain we started with. So we had to change how we think a little bit to work with intrinsic triangulations, but we really, really get some powerful algorithms in return for doing so. We can also borrow another algorithm from the plane, optimal Delaunay relaxation. Here the idea is rather than carefully inserting vertices, we insert them anywhere, but then reposition the inserted vertices according to a relaxation scheme to improve element quality. And sure enough, applying the scheme yields these really nice triangle angle histograms that you see down at the bottom, regardless of the angles in the input mesh, and all while exactly preserving the intrinsic geometry. Generally, I'd recommend that you use Delaunay refinement like we saw previously, rather than this optimal Delaunay retriangulation, but I want to share it as an example of yet another planar triangulation algorithm that we can now run on surfaces courtesy of intrinsic triangulations. We can also do adaptive mesh refinement. This is a technique which has been used to great effect in scientific computing, where the basic idea is to refine a mesh only where you need to in order to capture details in some particular solution.
and we won't go too much into the details of this application now, but what we see is that it works out just as well on surfaces as it does in planar problems. Now that we have access to this technique with intrinsic retriangulation, we observe uh, 2.5 to 10x speedups to get comparable accuracy solutions by using adaptive mesh refinement in the loop. And by the way, the last computation ends up being on as much as a 50 times smaller mesh. And another important aspect of retriangulation is generating constrained triangulations, which conform to some predefined set of lines, points, or so on. In the plane, this works so well that we commonly just specify a set of points and lines as input to planar remeshing and then generate a triangulation from scratch. On surfaces with intrinsic triangulations, we can at least preserve particular edges of interest, for instance feature edges, by splitting them while performing Delaunay refinement rather than flipping them. And once again, this is just borrowing the algorithm from the plane, which works for all the same reasons. You'll notice in the examples I've shown here on the bottom with the surfaces, the triangulation has these long, straight, geodesic red edges between points, and you might wonder where these come from. This is actually the subject of our next section, which is a whole other algorithm that we can run on intrinsic triangulations. Before we get into that though, I want to mention some software. Uh, if you follow the signpost link at the bottom, we have some software available, a little demo application in C++ where you can implement, import a 3D model, build a high quality intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, including refinement, export the triangulation, or even just build important matrices like Laplacians and mass matrices and export those in a standard format so that you can use them in other applications. If you're interested in a direct programmatic interface, the second Geometry Central link is a C++ library that has these routines implemented, as well as a suite of algorithms that can be run directly on intrinsic triangulations. So about those geodesic edges we saw, let's talk about a whole new algorithm, which is a simple greedy procedure that we can run on intrinsic triangulations in order to construct geodesic paths. The problem setting here is that we're given some curve on a surface and we want to find a locally shortest path or a geodesic in the same isotopy class. So for instance, here we start with this path between the two marked points and then we straighten it out to be a geodesic, which is like a straight line along the surface. In the second example, we do the same thing, but notice here that what we got out is clearly not the globally shortest curve between the two points, but rather it's the curve that we would get by straightening the initial one without tearing it or allowing it to pass over itself. And this is what we mean when we say in the same isotopy class. This isotopy property is really important because we want to use intrinsic triangulations in the context of curves that defined region boundaries. These are really important in geometry processing. And you really need this isotopy property to work with these region boundaries. Here's an example where we start out with curves that are the boundaries of two regions. And if we naively straighten each of these curves independently, then they start crossing each other and we no longer have a decomposition of the domain into regions. Whereas if we perform isotopic straightening, then the notion of regions is preserved and we can continue using these regions for downstream applications. So this is gonna turn out to be a really important property. The motivating observation for this algorithm is that, well, the edges of an intrinsic triangulation are already geodesic segments. And we have all of these nice data structures and operations that make these segments very easy to manipulate. So what if we could just modify the triangulation by performing some of these operations so that it contains the edge we want as a geodesic? And that's the main idea behind this algorithm. Remember that the atomic operation in Lawson's algorithm for flipping was to greedily flip non-Delaunay edges. Well, taking some inspiration from that, we'll instead greedily flip edges at non-shortest vertices until we eventually get out a geodesic path. In particular, you can imagine in the local region of some vertex, pulling the path as tight as you can without crossing any of the other vertices. And we'll do this all just by performing edge flips. So here around this vertex I you see at the bottom, we want to get out this shorter path uh, in the local neighborhood. So we perform edge flips and edge flips and edge flips until eventually we have this shorter path along the perimeter. And this technique is called the flip out procedure. More precisely, the way the flip-out subroutine works is to consider any interior node along the path through vertices I've labeled here as A, B, and C, where the path given in red is not yet a geodesic. And we can tell that it's not a geodesic because it makes an angle which is less than pi where it turns, so it's not as straight as it could be yet. What we'll do then is we'll look at the outer angles emanating from the vertex, and if any of those are less than pi, then we'll flip the corresponding edges walking upward along the perimeter.
So this first outer edge makes an angle less than pi, so we flip it. This next outer edge has an angle less than pi, so we flip it, and so on, until eventually the algorithm terminates in this state. Then, we'll take the path along the boundary, which is necessarily shorter than the path that we started with. So we just replace our initial path with that, and now we have a shorter curve than we started with. This routine always provably shortens the path, so we can just apply it repeatedly until the path is as short as it can be. It's a geodesic. Notice that this algorithm only needed lengths, angles, and edge flips, so we can immediately run it on an intrinsic triangulation. Here's what it looks like when we see this in action on a non-trivial shape. So we've started with this initial winding red path, and the algorithm is doing edge flips and edge flips and edge flips, greedily evaluating this policy as the curve gradually gets pulled tighter and tighter and tighter until it's a geodesic. This takes a lot of edge flips, but the actual runtime given in the corner here is just 12 milliseconds. And remember, we're preserving the geometry the whole time, so we can always go back and improve the quality of the triangulation afterwards if we want to. And this is all we really need. We can just apply this flip out procedure in an intrinsic triangulation to find geodesic paths, and also use basically the same technique to find geodesic loops. We can even do this to general networks of curves and loops, or curve networks on surfaces, which show up quite frequently in geometry processing. One example is cut graphs, where when cutting a shape to flatten it, we can make the cuts geodesics using this procedure, rather than having them be jagged paths along the input edges. Or we can also take the boundaries of a segmentation and straighten them to be nice, smooth, natural curves. Remember the key property of our algorithm that makes it well-suited to these kinds of tasks is that it always preserves the topology of the curve, or really it preserves the isotopy class of the curve network. And once we can straighten curves on surfaces, a simple de Castle-Jau style subdivision procedure also allows us to construct geodesic Bezier curves from control points. And as always, all the curves I'm drawing on in red here are the edges of an intrinsic triangulation, which hasn't been drawn. The really cool thing about taking this intrinsic triangulation perspective for finding geodesics is that this algorithm doesn't just generate geodesic paths, it also generates at the same time an intrinsic triangulation which exactly conforms to those geodesics. And this is really useful because then we can combine this machinery with all the retriangulation algorithms we just talked about and use it to create high quality conforming intrinsic triangulations of surfaces. So having this capability is gonna be extremely useful for some applications we'll see in some of the next slides. Once again, there's software available at this flip out link you see on the bottom. There is a demo package here which allows you to construct geodesics on surfaces from a wide variety of input data and refine them to be high quality triangulations as well as exporting the resulting paths. But let's see how all of this can be used to improve the robustness and accuracy of PDE-based methods in geometry processing. So these are problems where we're solving some systems of equations defined on surfaces to accomplish some useful task. Under the hood, this is all just finite elements in simulation. The important property of intrinsic triangulations is that even though we represent them a bit differently, we still have a triangle mesh and we still have ordinary linear basis functions on our triangles. This means that we don't need to make any changes to existing code or rederive algorithms beyond just computing the relative quantities from edge lengths, which is pretty easy. Algorithms retain their same basic properties, but accuracy and stability are improved thanks to working on a high quality intrinsic triangulation. And of course, you can also go beyond linear elements and use any kind of higher order basis functions you might want in conjunction with intrinsic triangles. These techniques are complementary, although we won't be going into that today. As a quick example, here's a case where we solve a simple Poisson problem on a CAD model, and we see that solving on an intrinsic optimal Delaunay triangulation compared to a traditional extrinsic ODT yields a two times more accurate solution for the same element count. And the same story is going to re be repeated many times over in this section. One more basic question to ask, though, is how to transfer data between our original triangulation and some intrinsic triangulation. Remember, we want to enable this kind of black box, uh, robust geometry processing interface, which means we need to be able to carry any high quality solutions we compute on our intrinsic triangulation back to the mesh you started with in order for it to be useful. And the way we do this is really gonna depend on the application. In some cases, you don't actually have to do any work at all. For instance, if you're doing some eigenvalue computation, in other cases, you might just need to transfer some data like a location. For instance, if you're finding a mean or a special point on the surface, you can just transfer that location back 
and this is something our data structures support as a standard operation. Or maybe if we're solving a PDE and getting out a value at every point, then you can just copy back those values at vertices because all the vertices of our input mesh were also vertices of every intrinsic triangulation. And this makes a lot of sense in a setting like geodesic distance. We'll see one more even fancier way to make a round trip later, but these basic methods will be enough for all the applications we're about to see. Let's look at computing geodesic distance using the heat method, which was one of the examples we saw earlier during the coding tutorial. If we apply this algorithm out of the box on this low quality triangulation of a rocket ship, we get a solution with massive, almost 60% error, which looks nothing like a distance function. Just doing intrinsic Delaunay flips takes the error down to 20% and gives us something that starts to look like a distance function, while intrinsic Delaunay refinement drops our error all the way down to less than 1%, and it hardly had to double the number of elements in the triangulation. The same holds true for other heat-based methods, such as using the vector heat method to compute the logarithmic map, where using the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation stops these foldovers and these egregious errors in the solution. We can also use this machinery for tangent vector field processing. Remember that we said the signpost representation is very natural for working with tangent vector fields, because it provides an intrinsic description of the tangent spaces. For instance, it can be shown that using the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation to build a matrix called the connection Laplacian, which governs vector fields, gives the property that our vector fields will always be flip-free, that is, each vector is contained in some convex cone of its neighbors. And this property is really useful for avoiding foldovers in field-aligned parameterization and remeshing problems. Here's an example of such a field, where we harmonically interpolate tangent vectors from the boundary to the interior of the shape. And if we do this naively, you get these a uh, few vectors, which I've circled in red, that point in the opposite direction of what you'd expect them to. And this is really disastrous for the results of a downstream algorithm. However, you can prove that using the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, this will never happen, and all the vectors sort of point in a sane direction. The same property also makes vector field energies smoother when working on intrinsic triangulations, and in particular, high quality intrinsic triangulations. Here we see where smoothest vector fields look much, much more natural when computed on a Delaunay refinement compared to along the original representation of the domain. Another nice example of intrinsic Delaunay triangulation in action is minimal surface generation. These are surfaces which, given fixed boundary locations, have minimal area or equivalently zero mean curvature. This is an interesting application because here we're optimizing for vertex positions. It's clearly an extrinsic problem, but we can still use intrinsic triangulations to build the Laplace matrix that shows up in the formulation and improve robustness to poor quality triangulations. Another task of this type is differential surface editing, where we want to deform a shape by smoothly interpolating displacements from a small number of control handles. And once again, a Laplacian shows up inside of this algorithm to define the smooth interpolation. If we run these procedures on this crazy mesh, which was produced from a bad implementation of a Boolean operation, then using normal cotangent Laplacian, it totally fails and outputs numerical nonsense, but just swapping in the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian gives a much more reasonable deformation. And remember that in all of these examples I'm showing, the really big deal is that we didn't have to change the underlying algorithm. We're just running the same algorithm on an intrinsic triangulation. And often, this is as easy as just swapping in a better Laplace matrix into the algorithm. Remember we saw that the flip-out procedure can be used to easily generate high-quality intrinsic triangulations which conform to a geodesic or a Bezier curve along a surface. And this turns out to give us some really cool new abilities to easily use these curves as boundary conditions for PDEs and applications. Here, for example, we compute a cross-field along a bone, which is aligned to geodesic curves drawn on the surface of that bone, and solve a Poisson problem, which takes its boundary condition from a Bezier curve along a mechanical part. In both of these situations, our flip-out procedure generated the constrained triangulation, which made it very easy to implement these boundary conditions. And one last point here. Remember I talked earlier about how we might transfer data from an initial mesh to the intrinsic domain and back. Just copying back values at vertices already works pretty darn well, and it was what we did in every example you just saw, but if you put on your finite element hat, you might find this to be a very unsatisfying solution. And in fact, you can do even better if instead you do a little bit more work and find the closest function in the basis of your initial triangulation.
So the idea here is to say we have a function in the basis of our intrinsic triangulation, and we want a function in the basis of our original triangulation, or vice versa. What we can do then is solve a little least squares optimization problem that says find the closest function in the other basis in the L2 sense. This amounts to just a linear solve, which can be prefactored, and the matrix entries for this problem are assembled over the triangles of the common subdivision. One of the many reasons why it's useful to have data structures that can robustly construct the common subdivision. Down below is an example where we use this technique to solve a Poisson problem on randomly generated low quality triangulations. Using intrinsic Delaunay and just copying back values at vertices already yields a 12 times increase in accuracy. But furthermore, transferring the solution back to the original basis by using this L2 transfer I just described decreases error by a factor of 25 compared to computing naively on the input triangulation. And even more broadly, intrinsic triangulations play an important role because they allow us to port all kinds of 2D geometric algorithms and run them along surfaces in a simple but rigorous way. Here's one example. We can compute approximate Steiner trees on surfaces by borrowing an algorithm from the planar setting and applying it exactly as stated on an intrinsic triangulation. As we might expect, this yields better uh, cuts in the resulting graph than taking the cuts on the original extrinsic edge graph, which might be very useful in the context of surface flattening and fabrication. This is just one particular case, but more broadly, you can imagine taking all kinds of algorithms from computational geometry and just running them on surfaces now that we have these intrinsic triangulations that allow us to manipulate surface meshes much in the same way we would, we would manipulate a triangulation of the plane. So to wrap up this section, we saw intrinsic retriangulation algorithms, which allow us to generate high quality intrinsic triangulations. And in particular, intrinsic Delaunay refinement is really powerful generating triangulations with low element counts and guaranteed angle bounds in milliseconds. This is a big deal because it's finally a surface remeshing scheme that has efficiency and quality in line with the planar case. We also saw how we can use intrinsic triangulations to construct geodesic paths by greedily flipping edges, and this is particularly useful to generate constrained triangulations that conform to particular paths along the surface. When solving PDEs, we saw that intrinsic triangulations can be used to greatly improve the robustness and efficiency of existing algorithms. And lastly, keep in mind that these triangulations can go even further, for instance, porting 2D computational geometry procedures to surfaces. Up to this point in the course, we've always started with a very strong assumption that the inputs to our algorithm are manifold oriented Euclidean triangulations. In this section, we're going to talk about how to relax some of those restrictions in order to apply intrinsic triangulations to a more general class of inputs. The first we'll talk about is non-manifold triangulations. Now, recall that a manifold triangulation is basically just one that looks like the plane topologically. So here we see a manifold and non-manifold edge and a manifold and non-manifold vertex. It's really important that we build algorithm that works on all meshes, not just the manifold ones. For the case of intrinsic triangulations, we can use a construction called the tufted cover to extend our techniques from manifold to non-manifold triangulations. It'll turn out that this same machinery as a side benefits allows us to use them for point clouds too. Non-manifold geometry comes from a couple different sources. The first of which is plain old topological defects, mistakes and errors that range from scanning procedures to buggy algorithms that just keep showing up in our data. Sometimes, however, we intentionally create non-manifold geometry, for instance, to concisely create 3D models for visualization. Perhaps the most interesting case is physically non-manifold surfaces, such as soap films or the interfaces between interacting liquids that we might want to simulate. So all of these cases can lead to non-manifold meshes, and it's really important that our algorithms be able to process them. Remember that our main approach to improve an intrinsic triangulation is to perform these intrinsic Delaunay edge flips. However, here we run into an issue. It's not clear what it means to flip a non-manifold edge. So we can't do intrinsic Delaunay flipping, and we can't build that high quality intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian that offers so many nice properties. What we're going to do is we're going to assemble what's called the tufted cover of the intrinsic triangulation, which makes every edge manifold. The way it does this is actually by making every vertex non-manifold, but that's fine. That's not going to bother us. 
Well, the tufted cover contains two copies of every triangle with duplicate vertices identified, and we can then flip edges as usual. So for visual explanation, if we start with some non-manifold mesh, here a simple one which, with just three triangles, then we can construct the tufted cover, do our intrinsic Delaunay edge flips on the tufted cover, and then read off the Laplace matrix or anything else we might want from that intrinsic Delaunay triangulation of the tufted cover. We call it the tufted cover because it looks a bit like tufted upholstery, where the vertices are like buttons. Notice that when we visualize the tufted cover, we displace the faces by bubbling them out so that you can look at them, but this is just for visualization. The geometry is always the usual Euclidean geometry. To tell you in a little bit more detail about how this tufted cover is assembled, we first make two copies of each face, so each face gets split into a front and back copy. Then we walk cyclically around each edge, gluing together adjacent faces. Notice that this depends on an ordering of the faces around each edge, but that's usually something we can read off from the embedding, or even just pick randomly if we need to. So once we have this tufted cover, then we just go through the usual steps. We flip to the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, read off the cotangent Laplace matrix, then we need to divide it by two, because our tufted cover is a double cover of the original domain, and use this V by V matrix as the Laplace matrix for our original surface. Now it has all the guarantees we love about the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian, including all positive edge weights, and generally more accurate results across lots of functions and geometry processing, like we saw in the previous section. So to recap, this gives us a pipeline where we take as input any triangle mesh at all without any restrictions on connectivity, build the tufted cover, flip it to intrinsic Delaunay, then read off a high quality Laplace matrix. In a way, this is really making good on one of our dreams for intrinsic triangulations because we have a robust black box machine with no restrictions at all that we can use to do high quality geometry processing. Now, in addition to generalizing all of the applications that we saw in the previous section, this tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian has a particular property with respect to boundary interpolation that I want to call out. This is interesting because it applies even on manifold domains. Imagine we wanted to interpolate these values defined at two marked points, so two vertex values pinned to 0 and 1. If we solved a harmonic interpolation problem with the usual cotangent Laplacian, it would give these values much greater than 1 as output up in the top region of the shape, which doesn't really make sense. Using normal Delaunay triangulations or intrinsic Delaunay triangulations doesn't actually help because the offending edge is a boundary edge. However, if we use the tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian, well, the tufted cover always has the property that it's closed, so this tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian actually gives a really strong guarantee that the outputs of harmonic interpolation will always be bounded by the inputs, even if your domain has boundary. Now, if you study finite elements, you might know that it's not well posed to, to pin vertex values in a harmonic interpolation problem, but nonetheless, this is a common and pragmatic thing to do, so it's a quite useful guarantee to get from this tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian. It actually turns out that the tufted Laplacian also gives you just what you need to carry a bunch of this machinery over to point clouds. So we're going to go in a different direction for just a slide or two here, and see how we can do some intrinsic Delaunay triangulations on point clouds. Point clouds are an alternate representation for surfaces instead of meshes, where you simply just store a large list of points floating in space. There are many definitions for Laplacians over point clouds, a particularly well-known one is the Belkin Laplacian. But we can actually use our tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian on point clouds as well. The basic idea is to first locally triangulate the neighborhood of each point, then union all of these triangles together to get a crazy non-manifold mesh with many repeated faces and lots of crazy connectivity, but it doesn't matter because we can still build the tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian and read off the corresponding Laplace matrix. This is a really great point cloud Laplacian because it has good sparsity properties, it's just as accurate as the cotangent Laplacian is, and furthermore has the guarantee of positive edge weights that we like about the usual intrinsic Delaunay cotangent Laplacian. In experiments, these benefits really do bear out in that compared to other point cloud Laplacians, the tufted Laplacian has all of the expected numerical properties, such as uh, always yielding a positive greens function and avoiding numerical underflow. Uh, 
And in fact, because it has so many similar properties to our mesh Laplacian, it makes it really easy to port algorithms from meshes to point clouds. In particular, here's two examples where we solve parameterization problems based on Laplacian by just taking the mesh algorithm and running it on a point cloud using this tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian on the point cloud. Now, Mark is going to tell you about a totally different kind of generalization. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about how intrinsic triangulations arise beyond the world of Euclidean geometry that we've focused on so far. The key thing that makes intrinsic triangulations work is that three edge lengths uniquely determine a triangle on the plane up to rigid motions. Hence, if we have a length per edge of the mesh, this uniquely determines the geometry of each face, and thus determines the intrinsic geometry of the surface. But who said that we should only think about triangles in the Euclidean plane? We could, instead, consider triangles on the sphere, or even on the hyperbolic plane, which are also determined by their edge lengths. One example which shows up from time to time are ideal hyperbolic polyhedra. These are surfaces whose faces are hyperbolic triangles. Just like ordinary Euclidean intrinsic triangulations, we can encode these ideal polyhedra by storing a length per edge, and we can change our triangulation by performing intrinsic edge flips while always encoding the exact same geometry. And it turns out that a lot of the theory about intrinsic triangulations actually comes from this hyperbolic setting. For example, in Riven's original paper where he first stated the definition of an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, he immediately used it to prove things about ideal polyhedra. And from a mathematical perspective, these ideal polyhedra are in many ways more natural than the Euclidean polyhedra we focused on so far. For example, in the Euclidean polyhedron, we can only flip an edge if its neighbors form a convex quad, but in the hyperbolic setting, there is no such constraint. And ideal polyhedra are more than just a mathematical curiosity. They're useful for algorithms too. There's a recent discrete uniformization theorem, which guarantees that you can always compute a discrete conformal parameterization of a mesh, no matter how low quality the input triangulation is. Although it sounds unrelated to hyperbolic geometry, this theorem and the accompanying algorithm depend essentially on ideal polyhedra in many of the intermediate steps. And the integer coordinate representation of intrinsic triangulations actually grew out of a data structure that we first used to track correspondence between triangulations of ideal polyhedra. Okay, we're going to wrap things up today with a very brief discussion of open questions and an outlook on what comes next. So this intrinsic viewpoint has been building up for many years, starting in the smooth setting and gradually into discrete and computational algorithms. But our feeling is that we've really just scratched the surface with this approach. And there are a lot of open questions that remain. So one very basic question, in fact, the very first question about intrinsic triangulations raised by Alexandrov in the early 20th century is how to go the other direction from an intrinsic description back to an extrinsic one. So I really wanna be able to go out in the world and take measurements only of length and recover the exact geometry. A more precise description of this problem is given a discrete metric, find vertex positions F in R3 or Rn that realize this metric, right? So the distance between these vertex positions should equal the given edge lengths. In the convex case, this turns out to always be possible as shown by Alexandrov. And there's even a nice algorithm by Bobenko and Izmestiev based on minimizing a convex energy. But algorithms for the general non-convex case are still not completely satisfactory. So they either kind of secretly require some additional extrinsic information, like dihedral angles, or they provide a solution that isn't exact. It doesn't exactly match the given edge lengths, or doesn't come with any hard guarantees of when and, and how well it works. Okay, so the open problem is to really solve this problem for real, or at least say something concrete more beyond the convex case about when it can and can't be solved. An even harder but also more useful version of this problem is when I'm given just a polyhedral metric rather than a particular triangulation and want to find an embedding. So why is this harder? Why is this in fact any different from this first problem? Well, because I don't know a priori which triangulation actually supports an embedding. So for instance, a cube, of course, can be embedded in R3, but not every intrinsic triangulation of a cube admits a face-wise linear embedding into R3, okay? So the open question here is whether determining 
the embeddable triangulation is just as hard as actually finding the embedding itself, or is there some smart thing we can do at the beginning to figure it out? One brute force idea is to slice up the domain along all uh, minimal geodesics between pairs of vertices, and this is something we've actually tried, but even this doesn't guarantee that things will work out. A bit more modern question, maybe a little less theoretical question, is how to ask where and how we can extend this intrinsic thinking to the volumetric case. So for instance, it's not hard to at least define what intrinsic Delaunay means in n dimensions, just embed a pair of n simplices in Euclidean space and ask that their circumscribing n balls be empty. An unfortunate fact is that even in 3D, there's no greedy flipping algorithm. Basically, the problem is that unlike the 2D case, a non-convex pair of tetrahedra may not yet be Delaunay. And so you can't flip it because you basically cause the mesh to sort of fold over itself. So an open problem is, what's any algorithm for constructing intrinsic Delaunay triangulations in 3D? It doesn't have to be done by this greedy bistellar flip algorithm, okay? And in fact, do such triangulations always exist? Or maybe there's some other notion of optimality for intrinsic triangulations in 3D that's, that's easier to find, okay? And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more questions to ask here that can have a really big impact on geometry processing and scientific computing and so forth. So for instance, we've already talked about adding vertices to the mesh, but what if we wanna simplify our geometry? Is there a meaningful way to talk about removing cone points to do this kind of coarsening? We mentioned earlier on the efficiency of the Delaunay flip algorithm and whether there's a way to be sure that it'll always be efficient as it appears to be empirically. Um, Ripa's classic theorem says the smoothest way to interpolate scalar data at vertices is to use the Delaunay triangulation. Is there a well-posed version of this for vector value data, which is increasingly important in, in all sorts of applications? Can the flip-based approach to geodesics be modified to yield not only locally, but actually globally shortest paths? Is there any algorithm at all for constructing intrinsic Delaunay triangulations in dimension three or greater? and on and on and on. So if you want to hear more questions or you think you might have answers, don't hesitate to reach out and chat. Okay, before wrapping up, I just want to mention that free and open source code is available for many of the data structures and algorithms that we've shown today, uh, thanks to the hard work of Nick and others in our, our lab. So please go out and try them if you like. We'd love to hear what does and doesn't work for you. At a very high level, I think this topic of intrinsic triangulations is a great example of how some pretty deep perspectives from mathematics and differential geometry can be used in the computational setting to address some important contemporary problems, such as grappling with the increasingly poor quality data that we're finding in, in geometric applications. On the whole, intrinsic triangulations already provide some major utility for geometry processing with lots of quality guarantees and structural guarantees and especially providing kind of a, a bridge between uh, kind of good algorithms and bad data. So maybe sort of a new Swiss army knife for geometry processing. But a lot more remains to be done and we really hope that we've inspired you today to head off and forge your own path in this direction. Thank you very much.